Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another week of the MLE Huddle and another breakdown. We are going to Brazil, and where we've got exciting uh, cardio, some absolutely top names fighters. And I tell you what, I'm pretty excited about when I did the research on the fights. Obviously, when the announcement came out, I was excited by some of the fights. But man, this is some cracking names, some new additions as well to the UFC roster, which people might not have seen before, might not know, and they should be quite excited about. Yeah, no, it's a good. It's a. Uh... We were just talking about this before. It's really, really solid kind of first fight night card after obviously the big jump on ESPN. So but they're going to Brazil and they're putting big names in big spots, which in the past you maybe had a big main event and kind of fillers throughout the card. But you've got Aldo, Mikano, great main event. Uh, and then you've got Damian Maia you throw in there as well. And you've got a couple of uh, couple up and coming fighters from Brazil. Um, it's a good card, really, really fun, solid card, and I think everybody will be looking forward to it because it's we've had another wee break, but now we're into like a serious run of week to week cards, pretty much to the end of March, and I think we've got a week off, and then it goes again in April through May. So, uh, yeah, good card, we're looking forward to it. Some new names on the card, which I'm looking forward to uh, talking about. So, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And ladies and gentlemen, anyone who's listening for the first time, or maybe has already listened and they've not hit that subscribe button, if you could do me and Will a great solid and just hit that button down below, it takes two seconds, hit the subscribe button. And every time we post a podcast or an interview, uh, I was going to arrange an interview. Uh, I, I was going to interview Lou Long and Jim Wallhead for their Bellator fight. And then Lou Long went and broke his leg. So that fight fell through. But <laughs> either way. I'll be, like, I will get interviews in, as long as the guys don't injure themselves. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, jump on the subscribe button, follow us on social media, feel free to comment below. As you see, if you look at previous podcasts, uh, there's little feeds happen, guys drop comments down. Uh, don't, just remember, this is just our personal opinion on the breakdowns. It's a 50-50 guess at the end of the day, because anyone could be anyone on a given day. Someone could have a bad day, someone could have an injury that we don't know about, that mm-hmm. no one knows about. Like look at Cain Velasquez, Junior Santos. No one knew about Kane's leg, and then he gets starched, and then next time they fight, he murks him. So it's all on what we could see on the footage, and we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if stuff in their life, relationships are falling apart and all that. We don't know all that, but we try to focus on what we can on the technical aspect, and we give our opinions. So feel free to comment below. If you want to be uh, a troll, feel free to comment as well. I'll just delete it. It's all good. Trolls can get deleted like that. It's That's great. I don't, I don't, I don't mind... Uh, I think there was one for the last card about me about Cejudo and I was like at the end of the day as long as Cejudo wins the fight then it looks good in my favour so yeah. but everybody like to say if you've got a, a, a bit of a difference from us don't be scared to kind of voice it but mm. come across don't come across as being a troll because like we say we're just not going to waste our time dealing with people like that so like I say if you don't like I've been on here long enough to, to know that People just don't disagree with you, no matter what you're saying. If you get it right, if you you can nail a fight down to the team, they're still going to find the little thing to say you got that wrong or this and that. But like, um, like everybody's wrong. Everybody sees fights different um, to what you do. So so yeah, but don't be scared to if you don't um, approve to what we say, let us know about it and tell us your opinion on it, and we'll, then we'll go back and forward on yeah. that a little bit. So yeah. We might see something that you yeah. guys mentioned that we didn't see. Yeah, and it's and for us then, I'll have a look. I go, actually, yeah, that's a good point. You might have a good takedown defense from maybe certain fights that we didn't see. It happens. It's all good. We love to discuss fights anyway. Yeah. So let's uh, kick off this Brazil card. Uh, Down at the bottom, uh, a flyweight fight. I I still don't know what's happening with this flyweight division. It's so weird because they they just signed Henry Cejudo's training partner, Bulldog or something called B Bulldog. I can't remember the full name. They just signed him. It's weird. Well, then they made a load, they cut a load of guys from the well, flyweight division. So I don't, they told guys to go, well, I don't understand what is going on. I think it's a mess. Mm-hmm. I don't think the UFC have quite got a grasp on it. Let's be brutally honest. I don't care uh, what anyone says. Uh, anyway, so we've got, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to murder some of these names. i uh, just going to put it out there now. I'm going to absolutely murder them. Uh, so, uh, Madamed, sorry, Magomed Biblotov against Ruggiero Bonteri, or Bonturin. Bonturin? Yeah, enough or off. Yeah, that's enough. Well, kickstart us off with these two fine gentlemen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I say, I've always loved the flyweight, so the fact that they're still putting some flyweight fights on uh, kind of makes me happy, and I was kind of super happy that Sahudo did what he was supposed to a couple of weeks ago, and if, we, if the division is going to stay around, it's um, 
something that Henry kind of went out there and did because I guarantee if he lost, it wasn't going to be sticking around. It still might not stick around, but um, the funny thing is, like, they had the Dana White Contender Series and there was, like, three fights on there in the flyweight division now. They must have knew beforehand that if these flyweights do well, look look good, then they're going to, some of them might get signed and like, some of them, these guys are going to look vastly kind of undersized at 135. So hopefully they keep it around, but who knows, we'll wait and see. A big fight for Bibelatov because he's coming back after that knockout where a lot of people didn't see that coming and I was, I'll put my hand up, I was one of those people, I did not see him get knocked out with inside two minutes by John Moraga who's never really shown that he's a one punch knockout guy but he certainly showed it in that fight. Um, before that, when you look at the fights that he had, just a very, very good, well-rounded fighter. Um, we've seen him in LFA, um, no LFA, World Series of Fights. We've seen him in the Akmat Grand Prix over there in Russia where um, he, he did very well over there. Just a, a pretty complete, well-rounded fighter and a guy that had a lot of hype before that loss. And I'm still, uh, I still think he's got a lot to offer. I really do. I think that he's a, he is a good fighter. He's a good grappler. Mixes any strike and fairly well, but we have seen that he can be hit with a big shot. And that's something, especially at the lower weight classes, if you've got a dodgy chin down there with the, the fast, speedy guys, uh, you're going to be in a lot of trouble now. Bontarin isn't one of those guys, in my opinion. I think that he's uh, he's more a grappling ace that, than anything else. And when you're against a Russian guy, your grappling has to be absolutely top-notch because uh, you're going to be fine. You're probably going to be fighting in small windows where your your opportunities are going to be very, very small. And I think this is what it's going to be in this fight here. Now, this is a big step up for Bontarin, who's uh, only losses to Tanaka, who was a UFC vet. Always a tough fight for anybody. It doesn't matter who he faced. I think Ricardo Ramos, who was on this card, is on this card, so he mm. faced Tanaka. And Tanaka's just a bad fight for anybody. He's hard to look good against. Um, and some of the, I think, some of the kind of mid- Tier guys will always look bad against people like Tanaka. So losing in the third round to him, I think, is the worst thing in the world. He went out, won a few fights, um, and then got, got himself into UFC with the Dana White show that they did in Brazil. Uh, and he won that in the second round over Gabriel uh, Gustavo Gabriel. I just don't think... Mm, I think he has to catch him on the ground. I think he has to get a position where he can catch people out of... Um, maybe in transition or maybe just surprise him with a throwing up a submission. And I just, I think that Biblito is going to play it really, really safe. He's going to take down. He's going to stay in guard. He's going to hit him with shots. I think he's going to stop um, Bonter and allow him to pass into positions where he could maybe get a submission. And I just think that maybe Biblito is actually just going to win across 15 minutes of the fight, just be that little bit better everywhere uh, and win the fight. Kind of maybe a 30, 27, 29, 28 if at the very worst. I like Bibelatov, though. Oh, I like uh, Bibelatov as well. I think the, the key is how he reacts to the first time of getting cracked. If he gets cracked in the fight, because uh, a lot of guys, and, and women, when, when they've got, had that first experience of getting absolutely murked, and whew, he got murked, like, oh, like he got rough, but then that left, it was a left, wasn't it, that finished off with Murrow. Okay? He cracked with the right, and then swooped the left, I think it was, off the top of my head. Yeah. Oh, I you got if I'm if I'm um Fonterra, I I'm gonna go I'm gonna go if I'm bar I'm going for I would go for land strikes because I think to myself my ground game is my where I want to be that's gonna be my A game is my ground game so I I think he's gonna be more, a bit more loose up front because he's not worried about the takedown so to speak so he'll feel more at home there so he'll be inviting the takedown so I think I think he'll have a really tough time getting. Bit down. I think he'll have a really hard time getting takedowns on him. You know, like it is pretty set in stone. These Russian cats, these Czechians, I've got legit grappling skills. Very good, like from Sambo experience, stopping a takedown, snuffing it. I think he'd have, I think uh, the problem you've got is getting Bilotov down. I don't think he can get him down. So I think he's, he's going to have to fight on the feet and be open and hope. You know, hope the takedown opportunities happen on him. Um, but again, if I'm Bilotov, I would time it at the right time, get the takedowns, secure the points. Just even be heavy enough and just pressure enough. Short little shots, up they get, break, referee breaks him. I don't see anything too much in this fight. I don't think Bilotov, I, I, I can't see him getting finished because I just don't know how he's, how he's going to mentally feel going into the fight. 
And I think at home as well, home soil, let's say, um, Boratin's just going to have so much adrenaline pumping through. You know, you're going to have to chop his head off to stop him. You know, it's just the way they are, with, especially making his debut. He's just going to be wired. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think decision win as well, 30-27. Uh, I just think he's, even though people talk about start, I just don't think Bar has that yet in the, his arsenal. You know, like you said, you look at his fights, a lot of them are grappling, as, uh, grappling aspects or submission wins. A, a lot of them are submission wins, sorry. So that's just, his, that's just bread and butter. Uh, let's go up to the bantamweight division. Kraken bout, which was against two. It's still, they're massive. Like, how you, like, it's massive bantamweights. Uh, Ricardo Ramos against Sad and Mega Medov. Uh, the cousin, is, yeah, the cousin, isn't he, of, uh, could be, a be, yeah, yeah, so the cousin of a be. Who we, we spoke about before when he uh, debuted, he is not like Habib. He just, he's like, he's, he's like the polar opposite of Habib. He's legit, awesome, fun to watch striker. Uh, you know, throws spinning kicks, uh, throws like just nice combination, flowing combat uh, uh, kind of combos with kicks and punches, mixes it up well. He has shown that he's got the grappling aspect when he needs to integrate that in a fight. I think uh, Ricardo Ramas is going to have a tough one. Uh, in this one we've said because Ramos, uh, uh, Ramos sorry, likes to have a bit of range likes to have the distance likes to get that you know likes to control that range I don't think he'll have it he had a tough time in the um, Kang fight which I thought Ramos was going to have a safer fight in that Kang one I, I thought Ramos should have came a lot away from that fight a lot more unscathed but he got hit a few times man and I, and I just see said as a more polished striker i see him as a better striker than kang so my question is how much damage can ramos take in this fight can ramos maybe control the distance more i don't know i just think said so good at closing the distance with strikes he's good at you know just throwing these kicks to close the distance down to integrate the grappling I i'm curious to see what he can do in this fight i, I am favoring said i would not be surprised if he gets a finish um, I'm going to go TKO third round for said. I just think Ramos has got a, can take a take crack, but his op opportunities there and said just has such a variety. I just don't see what Ramos is going to have to, to kind of counter or greater what said can offer. So I think we've only scratched the surface of what we saw in said so far. Mm. And I think he's such a fun addition to this bantamweight weight class. Um, I, I think Ramos is going to have a tough time in this one. I think he'll not have a plan B for when it's not working. Won't get the takedowns. Won't get. Won't win the grappling aspect on the takedowns. The he, fighting close isn't really for him either. It doesn't suit him. And I think if it goes close, I think Sed's got the capability to get the fight down if he wanted to. If he doesn't like how it's going, but yeah, I'm gonna go with Sed third round stoppage. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, well, I'll say this about Ricardo Ramos. I've been. I've been kind of on the last few fights. I've been like, when he first came into the UFC. I bet him as a plus two hundred underdog against Tanaka, like we just talked about before, uh, and we 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 know how awkward he is as a fighter to to face, uh, and he won that fight. The next two, I went against him against the Habi and Kang, and I'm still. I'll put my hand up. I bet Kyung Ho Kang. I still think he won that fight. Uh, I've watched it a couple of times uh, within the last two weeks, uh, and it, but I can see it was a close fight. It was a really, really close match fight, a really well match fight actually. I'm a big fan of Kyung Ho Kang. I think he's he's a huge guy for that division, very strong, very athletic. Um, so and like I say, I thought I went when went to the scorecards. I thought I had a chance to win that bet, and I was close, but not close enough. Uh, I've actually went and bet Ricardo Ramos this week. I went and, well, actually, not this week. It was last week when he was an underdog. Now he's the favourite. So I got him right before the line switched. Um, and uh, it was when I was watching the Scoggins fight, the one thing that really I saw was Justin Scoggins was able to get underhooks really easy when his back was against the fence and was able to manoeuvre out which was a little bit, I thought Namagamero would be able, be able to kind of keep him there a little bit longer. Now, towards the end of the fight, maybe in the late second, uh, maybe the mid part of the third, 
he did he did eventually get that takedown. He did kind of keep Justin Scoggins there. But that was a smaller guy. Scoggins is not the size of Ramos is. Ramos is a good, good physical fighter, big guy. I think they're pretty similar in height and reach, so there's not too much difference between them there. Uh, but I just think that Said needs to get the fight to the ground and keep it there. And I think he could be a... Now, we haven't really seen much from Ramos, kind of danger-wise with his jiu-jitsu. I think he's got some skills down there. Um, but we really haven't kind of seen how good he is. I just, I don't think he's going to get taken down as much as I think. Uh, as, I, as I first thought, I actually thought mm, maybe Namakimero could get him down and keep him there. And I just don't see it. Another aspect I was thinking, can you put him against the cage and keep him there? And you watch the Justin Scoggins fight and Justin was able... Now, Justin's a really kind of nippy fighter on the feet, so he can move very, very quickly. So maybe that's... Maybe I'm overlooking that a little bit. Just how quick Scoggins was, and uh, maybe timed the movements of side enough where he could just manoeuvre out. So, uh, but and towards the end of the Kang fight, you've seen that Ramos can actually take the fight to the ground, and he was he kept Kang there uh, a little bit longer than I thought he could. I didn't think he'd be able to keep him there for as long as he did. Um, I just think as strikers, I think he Ramos is the cleaner striker. I think he he keeps range better. He pressures forward. I don't think Namagamera has got the, the power to really hurt him. I think Kang was one of the, Kang caught him with a few big, big punches. Didn't really phase him all too much. He got countered uh, pretty, pretty well against Kang. I thought Kang fought a really good fight. Maybe that's just me being a bit biased because I had money on him, but uh, it was oh. a very close fight. Uh, and Ramos is the guy I've liked for a long time. Even before he went to UFC, he faced Manny Vasquez, who's a guy that I liked in the regionals, and he lost. I think it was the Dana White show. Uh, and he lost very quickly via submission in that one. The way I kind of see it is I don't think he gets pushed against the fence. I don't think he gets kept there. And now if these guys are in the middle of the cage, I think that the, the better striker at range is Ricardo Ramos. Um, and I mean, his knockout, his knockout of Zahabi was absolutely stunning. But I think that, I think Namagomedov is better than Zahabi. I think Zahabi's, have we seen him since that fight again? I don't, don't think we have. So, I think um, his brother though was, well, no, his brother, he probably said, "Look, take a break. You're young yeah. in, your, in your career. Yeah. Like, look at Freddie Roach and um, Pacquiao. He said, look, you'd be, and that was like you said, it was a good knockout, and it was, yeah, it was a pretty heavy knockout. It's probably like, look, take a break, take a year off, let your brain recover, and mm -hmm. then go back to it. And, yeah. and, and look, he probably might come back and look, it might look good. Yeah, yeah, he could do. Uh, like I say, I went, I tried to feed Ramos his last two fights." turned out that I went against him and it worked to my kind of detriment in the end. Um, I just think he's got enough to win this fight in Brazil as well. It's two hours from, like, I think he's the closest fighter to, like, that city of Fortaleza. He's did this whole camp in Brazil. He hasn't went to Team Alpha Male, which is a little bit kind of interesting considering that Namagomedov, he's kind of, he's got some grappling uh, and you'd think the better grapplers that he'd be working with at Alpha Male, your Mendes is, your so on. Um, so that kind of that, that that's a little bit of a kind of interesting one, but he is the closest fighter, so he's as close to a hometown fighter as I think as anybody's going to get, and he looks in great shape from what I've seen online. Um, but obviously, fight weeks are different thing; things happen. I just think that he's he's going to be the better overall fighter here. But Namagomedov, I think I think there's some scope for him at one thirty-five. I think he could he, he could beat some guys up there for sure. I'm just going to go back to Ramos here and see if he actually gets it done. When I saw him at underdog odds, I thought I think it was maybe the old. Kind of coming from the past with Tanaka, where he cashed for me. I think as, but now the lines flipped. It is going to be a closely run fight. Uh, so, like I said, I bet Ricardo Ramos. I'm going to pick him here. I'm actually going to pick him via stoppage. I think he, I think he knocks him out via TKO in the late late part of round two. So, uh, yeah, that's where I'm going with that one. Nah, it's okay. And this next fight, all plays in German, is an addition that is late, <laughs> as in so late that we didn't know about this until after our research, and we booked, and we obviously scheduled to do this. Um, I, and I we're still absolutely blown away about how or why this matchup's been made. Two guys from the regional scenes stuck on the UFC card. It's not going to. You got Jose Aldo on the card. You will sell out with Jose Aldo on the card. You don't need two random nobody guys, um, who I'm sure might have a career in the UFC, but right now we didn't have time to look at it. And you have uh, Geraldo de Frietas Jr. against Felipe Colares. Uh, obviously, with zero research, I'm going to go with. Geraldo, because uh, just, a, just a weird, funky name. So yeah. we'll go with that. I'll go with Kolaris just to... to but like yeah. I said, I've, 
I knew nothing oh. about this fight, and I look at fight cards all every day. But this one just popped up. I don't know how I missed it. So I don't yeah. know when it was announced. So I, t- I, I checked it twenty four hours ago, and yeah. that was not on there. So for some reason, they have put this on super late. Yeah. Obviously, the fight they would have known about the fight themselves before yeah. this, but it's weird. Maybe I just missed um, it. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, so with next up, we have in the heavyweight division, uh, Junior Alban uh, Albini against. Oh, Ah, gosh. Do you know what? It's annoying. I watched the dude, watched him fight, listened to his name several times. Look, I've got it. Just call him Jorzino. Now, call him Jorzino. Yeah, Jorzino. Yeah, Jorzino R. Yeah, we'll call him Jorzino. Uh, Will, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Will, go ahead. Um, yeah. How do you see this one? Yeah, like, uh, the UFC always need kind of heavyweight, so this was a surprise one, because I, I know that he signed a multi-fight deal with Risen. Uh, I think it's Rosen Struik, I think it's how you pronounce it, but still... Jorzy knows what I'm going to call him. Um, still fairly young, though, in his kind of MMA career, 5-0. and um, But I think he went 76-6 and six over a 10-year span as a kickboxer. So the guys, if he's a kickboxer, you know what his main skill set's going to be. And that's going to be um, a striking. The guy's got power. He's got a really nice jab. He's got a laser kind of jab. It is really, really good. Um, his last opponent, he was supposed to... He was fighting Kovalev over there and... Uh, Japan and I thought from the very get go of that fight that Kovalev I know a little bit about him not too much but I knew coming from Russia uh, he's going to go for takedowns and he, he kind of stood with kind of Jorzino a little bit and he, he got picked up he picked up a little bit and uh, Jorzino just really kind of beat him in a very 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 close fight there wasn't really that much between them so I was kind of surprised. I had heard him before that, obviously through the Resident Show. It was the first time I ever heard him. And then I heard he got signed to the UFC. And oh, fucking Junior Albini is one of those guys that have... Like, that Olenek fight, I don't know how those guys... They, they keep getting caught in it. Like, surely they must know the alarm bells must be, like, ringing, ringing, ringing. That one, once that guy gets his arms around you, you just have to be doing everything. Knee him in the nuts. Do whatever you need to, to try and get out there. Try and do something. And he stood there taken to the ground and then that was that I I don't think I can trust Junior Albini again um, if I'm being honest with you and I think I, I, the the limitations were kind of shown in the Arlovsky fight because he respected Arlovsky so much he even came out and said that that he just didn't throw any, any shots here he's fighting for his UFC career here he's fighting in Brazil, he's not going to have too many better opportunities at winning fights in the UFC, he's got the more experience over Jorzinho but striking wise I uh, I think that Jorzinho has him beat there, if I'm being honest with you. I think that, uh, like I say, Jorzinho's got, he's a dangerous striker, massive power on both hands, uh, but he's also pretty technical. Like I say, his jab's really, really good. Uh, he can throw some flying knees, some switch kicks, um, but he's only really fought outside the first round once, and that was that fight against Kovalev as well. So, uh, and Kovalev's, yeah, he's all right, he's all right. I'm sure he'll probably win a fight or two in the UFC, considering the way the heavyweight division is. But his cardio, to be fair, kind of it held up kind of through the middle part of the fight into the fifth, uh, the third round. It kind of started to wane, but these are heavyweights. That's going to happen. Um, and his takedown defense, I don't think it's too bad. Um, I think there's a good matchup actually from the UFC. I think they did well with matching these two here. Albini, I think, got good Muay Thai, uh, decent speed, and like I say, Rosen Struix, athletic and, and powerful. Uh, but Albini's fairly kind of flat footed, where Jacinho is. I don't want to say he's light on his feet, he's a heavyweight, but he, he's definitely not as flat-footed as what Albini is. He, when Albini throws, he doesn't really move his, he's kind of, I don't want to say move his legs, but his feet are just planted. Um, and Rosenstruck, I think, can can capitalise on that with his big explosive power and just his, his athletic kind of structure. So I think that uh, Jorzino's actually going to catch him here and knock him out. I think they get into a little bit of a striking exchange. I see... Jorzinho is a better striker. I think he knocks him out, and I think he knocks him out in the first round. So I'm going to go Jorzinho, a uh, knockout round number one. Yeah, I watched that risen bout as well. He had my only concern was the right hands. He kept cl- he kept getting hit. Yeah, you know, he kept, he kept, yeah, and it was the same punch every time. I was like, just put your hand up. I don't know what was going on. Like he just kept getting clipped with his overhands. And that, that probably could stem from his kickboxing career. With kickboxing, you don't get overhands. It's straight hooks, uppercuts, all that jazz. Uh, and and it's, it's a bit out of the norm, the overhands, so it's not something I'm used to. Obviously, the smaller gloves makes a difference when 
he's done, like you said, he's done years. I watched some of his kickboxing bouts. Um, I watched one of the ones he had against a dude who was bloody ginormous compared to him. <laughs> so I watched, and, and it was crazy. as a heavyweight fight, and I thought, man, he must be a big heavyweight. He must be like 220 or something. I went into it. He's 245 pounds. So I have no idea what the other dude was. But it was just like watching Bob Sapp back in the day. Like, the guy was massive. And, like, <laughs> and Josino was taking hits from him. And I was like, oh, my word. Like, he was getting hit. And it was like, I think I would probably forget my name by the end of that fight. It was, but Josino won. He not the dude out of the second round. Just clipped him. Just put him. The dude just, he couldn't get up. He didn't know what was going on. You know, it was like, can you count a 10? Uh, one, two, purple. It was just, the guy was gone. It was just fantastic to watch. And... Um, how many more of us? He hasn't. I know it's uh, kickboxing. There wasn't that much. There wasn't much head movement, and that's my only quite worry with Josino going forward. Not this bout, but going forward, maybe incorporate a little bit more head movement. Your combinations are there. He's like a Gokan Saki, so to speak, isn't he? Let's put it this way: the Gokan Saki, the heavyweight division, which means he's going to get so far, but there's probably going to be he'll have it. He'll have a line. He'll have a ceiling that he'll reach in the UFC, and he'll get found out. But Junior Albini, perfect fight to introduce yourself to the UFC. Albini's not exactly an athlete. Let's just put it out there, folks. The dude just can't be bothered to cut that weight off. He could sh shed off that excess weight and look better, perform better, be quicker, be lighter on his feet. But he just can't be arsed. He's like all of us. Loves a bit of cake. Loves a cake. You know what I mean? Likes a cup of tea in a Battenberg. Um, but from a, from a technical standpoint, Albini really is not too badly conditioned. Like, you I, I, I think maybe because of his output isn't super high. I think that's possibly what it is. And Josine, Josino, look, though, like you said, mate, he, he does have surprisingly good conditioning. That, in the, in the second or third round, he, he was a, a takedown attempt on him, reversed it, got on top. He was on top for a bit and showed a, a, an acceptable level of grappling on when he was on the ground. You know, I, I don't think he was lost. I don't think he did anything that was making me think, oh my gosh, if anyone gets him down, that's the end of him. Like he showed uh, a comp, he was quite, you know, calm, showed some good movement. You know, he didn't, he, and obviously he's been doing stuff since then. He's been training since, and it would have been quite a lot of focus would have went into it. Uh, I just don't think Junior's going to have uh, the, the knowledge on the technical aspect to be quick enough to be as, to catch with Jorginho. So, he won't be smart enough. The fight IQ won't be there for him to realise what openings there are. Josino will be faster at realising, OK, he's dropping his hand, he's dropping this, he's moving here. There's a leg kick there and I can open up the leg kick to go for a head kick. Or, you know, the, the, uh, his technical analysis is a far, he's far quicker with that fight IQ at, at, at picking someone apart on the feet. If I'm junior, I'd charge at him and just try to get him down. That's all I would do. I'd like, I would have no gap. That's, I would be like glue. For the full, full, full 50 minutes, I'm like, get that close to him. Don't let him, t don't let them separate. But it's not going to happen. Jo Josino is, uh, he's smart. He's got good grappling uh, on the feet in the clinching. In the clinching, he's got good knees, good elbows. So it's a, it's a, it's a, de it's a, it's a danger for Junior. I, I just can't see anything in Junior that makes me go, he can do it. Uh, I go in. You said first round knockout. I'll go second round knockout. I'll give Junior a benefit of doubt. I think that extra bit of winter warm, winter coat will help sustain him for a bit longer and get him to the second round. Um, but yeah, that's uh, I don't I don't hold much out in that fight for. Definitely a stoppage coming. Uh, we're going to fly with division next. Uh, we have the cartel trafficker in uh, Mara Romero Varela against uh, Talia Santos. Well, I'm looking forward to Santos making a UFC debut. Yeah. What's really weird, she's 15, I know. So she won in the Dana White contender team. So if we take away the Dana White one, she was 14, I know. And the UFC hadn't signed it. I'm not being funny. Go out there and find me a flyweight woman, a woman flyweight who's 14, who's 10 and 0, who's not in the UFC. You don't exist. So yeah. how on earth she took this long to get signed up by the UFC? I just don't get it. And well, I went back and watched some of the fights from... Not like like the, like of late. I went back to when she was like six, seven, eight, and oh, and I was mm -hmm. like, she's good enough to go in. She was good enough in six, seven, eight, and oh to get into the UFC. When you look at the the kind of level that's in there now, or even at the time, you know, you had Kaylin Curran. I was like, she would have charged it. So, so 
I am super hyped for Santos. Uh, Barella, not so much. Because she's a drug dealer in the UFC, has no morals. Uh, so if you don't know much about her, she did the uh, she was trafficking weed and cocaine, weird mix, <laughs> really weird mix. <laughs> but uh, in in Italy, loads of it's mental story. Honestly, if you look into it, it's absolutely nuts. so. Go and have a look at that, folks, online, and it's all true. Um, but my only issue is for Borella is she went to, for the cooking and fight. Um, who was like the Venus Williams of MMA with all that shouting, but she, her output, that was like, cooking just overwhelms you with output. She just throws punches, shouts out every time she does something, and I think it was the second round of that fight. And they put the statistics out, they went, cooking and she's thrown 126, 120 odd strikes, 20 have landed, and I was like, that's one in six. One in six, yeah. that's insane. So, but all it does is, if you put a high enough output in front of Borella, she doesn't know what to do. She can't. She doesn't like output. She's very patient in that sense. If you give her time, she, she can do a bit more, but she doesn't like it if someone's just offensive. Santos is offensive. High output, just combo, combo, combo. She She's not... It's not too often she throws one or two strikes. I'd like Santos to set up her leg kicks a bit more sometimes. That's my only concern about her, is that... In, on a general ass, on a general scope, she throws her leg kicks on their own sometimes, which isn't great for telegraphing. Like if she fought like Suarez, Suarez could time that, get it down, and to pain the ass for it. So I think if she could set up her leg kicks a bit more, maybe just throw something out there, a couple of jabs, and then leg kick just to set up to, to disguise it a bit more. She throws lots of leg kicks, good combinations. She's got wicked clinch work, fantastic mm. clinch work. Like oh, she will. Her, her clinch work is horrible. They do not get mixed up with that. I just don't see the fight. I don't see the fight going to the ground. I think Santos can stop it going to the ground. I think she'll keep it up for three rounds. And she'll just light up Borella. I don't think Borella can just... I don't think she can handle the volume that Santos is going to come out with. And the Kukigan fight is the best example. She just... And, that, and she was trained at ATT for that one as well, Borella. So she had a stack of talent around her. She, she was training with absolute monsters in the, in the women's division anyway att so she wasn't it's like she was uh, not used to any kind of level of competition she had great people around her i i don't know where she trained for this camp i didn't really research it because i don't really know she was out if she was allowed out of italy at the time because of the court proceedings but yeah i'm santos three rounds of just lighting up barella I, I just don't see it going any other way i'm absolutely hyped for santos though mm. yeah well when you start with Santos, everybody's obviously going to go and look at our last fight, which was on the Dana White Container Series from Brazil. Um, and she, there were some things in that fight that really, really impressed me. It's like, And there, there were obvious things as well. Jab followed up with a leg kick. She's yeah. got dangerous leg kicks. She whips into them as well. She's got, it was good competition she fought as well. Yeah. Like Her opponent was legit as well. So. Yeah. So they picked someone out like relatively decent. When you look at the rest of her, kind of record it's not glamorous to say uh to say the least to be honest with a lot of kind of one and zeros and one and ones and but you're going to get that when you come up through brazil because it, the, obviously the sport's huge there everybody wants to be doing it you're going to put on cards you're not going to get matched up with people with similar records but uh, when i watch her last fight especially i took a lot out of it she set up her combinations where i think she could do it a lot better though i really do i think she's like i say a leg kicks and a jab their fundamentals of the sport, and if you are good at using those fundamentals and putting them together, then you're, you're going to, you, if you can build everything else around it, you're going to be really, really good um, in the future when you start facing better uh, opponents. She's definitely got a step up here, but I don't think it's that much of a step up. Honestly, I think uh, Barello's kind of take down a bust. She's not going to stand there. She's not quicker than this girl. She doesn't hit as hard as this girl. And she's definitely no, nowhere near as fluent as this girl on the feet. So if it stays on the feet, this girl's going to get picked apart. Now, if it goes to the ground, it'd be interesting. The few fights that I've seen a couple of years back of uh, Santos, I think it was the Rachel Cummins one I, I spotted on YouTube there. And Cummins wanted nothing with a stand-up. Literally went in for a takedown, pretty much held on to her back for three minutes. To be honest with you, the ref should have really stood them up after about two. But as soon as Santos was able to manoeuvre around and get any mount, she absolutely butchered her with ground and pound and the fight got stopped um, 
from there. So she's still a little bit of an unknown, and like I say, it's hard. To, um, there is some, a couple of fights out there. There's not an awful lot on her, but me taking away from her last fight and putting it into this fight, I just think that technically she's better, and she puts things together better. I just want to see what a takedown defense is like, because I've only seen that one or two occasions, and she's come out the other end and obviously won the fights through that. But maybe Romero, we saw in our first fight, with Faria, that if you now she's pretty dreadful on the ground, like Joanne Calderwood, everybody knows I love Jojo, but if Jojo's like submitting you, yeah, something's up. Something's <laughs> up. And I love Jojo, um, and she's supposed to be Brazi- supposed to be a Brazilian black belt, uh, jiu jitsu black belt as well. So I'm like, I don't know about that. Um, yeah, she's got she's got four three stripes. Yeah, yeah, hey. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so who knows? Like, I, I like what I see from Santos from her last fight. Like I say, it's not the only fight I've watched. I've watched, I think, at least two or three of her other ones where she showed fairly decent takedown defence. She was a little bit inexperienced in some positions, but when she got into the dominant position, she let you know about it and she hurt you uh, from those positions. So I think Santos can actually get her out. I think it, but Romero will, will start to... Um, when she starts eating those shots, I think that she'll she'll just start kind of culling into a ball and the referee will pull Santos off her. So... Uh, but I can also see where you, over 15 minutes of a fight, completely wrecking on the feet and and winning the fight with a decision. I'll go with a stoppage in this one here, and I'll go Santos uh, TKO middle middle part of the fight. Nice, yeah. It's it's honestly, folks. I think Santos is going to be a fun addition. Uh, I don't know what should be like against real good wrestlers, so we'll mm-hmm. see what happens with that. But next up, interesting one. Well spoken about uh, Tiger Alves again. Huge Brazil's. Brazilian uh, mixed martial arts star uh, against Max Griffin. Uh, so Max Griffin is fighting, and then his teammate Anthony Hernandez fighting next. So I was surprised he put the two of them one after another. I would have thought they would have had them separate on the card a bit for the coaching, you know, to talk. But uh, yeah, well, Alves Griffin, interesting. Well, we felt. Yes, it's um. Max Griffin's making improvements. There's absolutely no doubt about it. When he came into the UFC, and I think it was Colby had in his first fight, and as much as we brag on Colby, that's a kind of tough fight to come the UFC, and I think it was in short notes as well. Uh, but since then, he's, he's been 500 in the UFC, but, but he's obviously coming off that win over Mike Perry, which was followed by a loss against Curtis Millinder. And Curtis Millinder's a guy on the ascension. He's, he's not going down. Mike Perry, when Mike Perry fights smart, he usually wins fights. Doesn't happen very often, but yeah. Um, but his losses are to good, good guys. There's no doubt about that. Like um, Covington, Celeste de Santos, where he, where he showed a lot of heart and durability in that <clears> fight. <throat> and Melinda is a, a tough guy himself. He's on the ascension in that welterweight division. It's not a good fight, hasn't he, Curtis, next? Oh. Um, is he not fighting Zaleski de Santos? That was it, yeah. That was it. Ooh, what a fight that's going to be. Sorry, sorry. I've never seen his name. Yeah. Um, but when you look at his uh, his wins, uh, I might have said that he actually did. Did I actually say that Mike Perry won that fight? No, he didn't win that no, fight. No, no, no. no. Fight. Uh, he won that fight, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I was talking about Mike Perry there for a second. But. Um, when Mike Perry doesn't fight smart, I think what I was trying to say is that's when you can win the fight. Like the Cowboy Cerrone fight, for example, where he goes for takedowns against that. Um, and But in that fight, um, Max Griffin fought a really good game plan, fought long, got takedowns when he needed to, and just used the aggressiveness of Mike Perry coming forward to his advantage by getting takedowns and winning rounds through that. But also looked decent with, it, with his, his striking as well. Um, Thiago Alves... <laughs> I think he, I mean, he's 35 now, I want to say. Yeah, I think he was actually thinking about it. I think he was actually born in Fortaleza, so he might be the hometown guy here. Um, but he is definitely on the descension of his career, and he has been for, oh, I want to say, good two, maybe three years. He's been pulling out of fights left, right, and centre. Uh, I th- actually think he looked decent against Konchenko last time. And and if that was fight was in maybe another country, he might actually got the nod in that one. I thought the, the decision was just right. But uh, I'm struggling with this one because I think Alves is a very, very live fighter. And I think that he's got a good, good opportunity to win this fight. I just don't know. It seems like every kind of couple of years he puts on a really good kind of Muay Thai clinic. 
and it might be that time where he actually, he actually brings it back out here and he might show what he's all about from his previous days as a title contender where he was just a destroyer, he was so dangerous but we, we don't really see that that much here. I think that Griffin obviously has to not get hit with those leg kicks. I think that he has to fight smart. Don't leave your chin in the air because Santos, uh, Santos Alves is still very, very quick, got dangerous striking. But what Max Griffin needs to do is stay competitive on the feet and look for takedowns where he can tie up Thiago Alves and just kind of uh, slow him down. Once he starts slowing him down, I think he can get takedowns and that's how he can win the fight from there. So... I'm not super confident in Max Griffin. I'm going to pick him to win a decision, though. Um, but, yeah, I'm not super confident, if I'm being honest. It's a hard one, isn't it? Because Aves, you're right, he is the hometown boy. It's uh, yeah. He's fine. But it's is it because we know what Alves can do? Yeah. Like, I, that's, I think that's part of what it is that happens sometimes. You fall into that. We know what he is capable of, and he could release it. But I think the Konchenko fight was a part of it was Konchenko... Debut. I'm not saying Octagon Jitters, but I'm just saying he didn't show what he, we know because we were talking about how what an exciting talent he is, and we, we, we can't wait for him to get in there. I don't think he showed what he is like, what he's going or what he's capable of doing. I think the next time we see Kinchenko, we can get a bit more out of him if that makes sense. Yeah, because yeah, I think he's a far superior fighter than he was when he showed the Alves fight. I think he should have easily put Alves away and. Um, Alves is definitely there. He, he's, his, his reaction is slower than he was. Cause it, Tom Cause it hits like he used to, mate, either. We know that. We've seen it. Max Griffin just has to be smart. Just fight smart. Use your jabs. Use your takedowns. And just basically fight the way you did against Mike Perry, as you do with Alves. Because Alves is not a long-range fighter. He likes to get in close. He likes to show. He likes to go with the with the like the one two. He likes to get the hook in and then a leg kick. That's like Brett. Like the leg kick is key, like you said. I think Griffin's got. I think Griffin's not actually a dumb fighter. I think he's a smart fighter, and, and he and he shows it in fights where he is growing. He is starting to, um, in the fight be analytic. So he's he's breaking it down as it's happening. He's starting to realize like no need to don't scrap, get a takedown. And like he's smart at doing stuff like that. He's good at changing. The pace of the fight, like if things are going a bit wild, like the Mike Perry fight when Mike, the crowd was going wild, Mike was getting jacked, he's getting ready, swinging, and you saw Mike, uh, Max was like, "Let's switch it off, let's just stop momentum, take down, get on top, and just just slow everything down again." You reset, and um, I like that about Max. That's one thing I like about the way he fights. I think he's smart of it. I think you've got to do that against Alves in this fight. He's got to go have the crowd going absolutely nuts, and I mean Brazil nuts. Um, yeah, we like that. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, gonna be, it's going to be the volume's going to be insane. It's going to be really difficult for Max to hear his corner. Now, it sounds silly that, but corners are key in fights, especially when it's technical information coming. They're trying to give you some advice to help. It's going to be really hard for them to hear them if the crowd's going absolutely wild for uh, Alves, especially Alves as well. The judging some punches that might not look like they landed, the crowd will go, Yeah, he's landed something. You've got to be cautious of that. So if you're Max, fight, fight, fight point, fight technically, you know, get the takedowns, points. Land a jab, just break rhythm of Alves. Jabs, jabs will break the rhythm of every fighter. I think if you can land the jabs and then time the kicks maybe for a couple of takedowns, I'm going to decision win Griffin. But again, if Alves can go old school and release what we know he can, he can mess up. On his given day, a lot of people, majority of that well with division would have a hard time with Alves just going absolutely AWOL on him. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I've got a decision, Max, but I would not be shocked if Alves wins. It wouldn't shock me at all. And next up we have in the middle of the division, Marcus Perez, who is a Brazilian. Even though he looks not that Brazilian, it sounds weird, but when I see him, I didn't realise he's Brazilian. I went, I know it's Perez, but I thought he's like Mexican descent or something, but he's Brazilian. Against Anthony Hernandez, who's making his UFC debut. We got signed to the UFC. Uh, I like this fight. I like the matchup. Uh, I think it's a good one for Anthony uh, Hernandez to make his debut. Uh, like I said before, he's teammates with Max Griffin. He was on the Dana White show. He's called, is it Fluffy? His name? Yeah, it's Fluffy, yeah. Because yeah. cause he's a little bit fluffy around the edges. He could certainly trim up a bit. Um, so it doesn't look like your normal aesthetic fighter should, so to speak. You know, he just looks very bland and looks, looks like it doesn't work out. But the dude's got decent cardio, some good pop in his hands. 
Marcus Perez has shown that he is you, you have to hit him with a freight train to stop Mark like Marcus Perez it's a shame because he just takes an absolute beating in some fights like that Eric Anders fight was, oh I got you could have probably stopped that fight at some point you know he was Eric Anders was absolutely pounded away on Perez and he couldn't stop it um the Sanchez fight I can't ex- I thought it'd go that way uh, I thought Sanchez could have made a bit lighter of work of it but Marcus Perez operates with space he needs space to operate you know with his style because he's he's a bit flashy likes to go for the stuff he's not going to get it, i don't think with anthony hernandez i think hernandez i don't want to say like a brawler but he likes to just be in in, in range of the hands because when he lands it hurts like that dana white fight he didn't land much clean was it a right was it a right i think he threw a right straight and it kind of just glanced the kid and the kid just kind of shelled up straight away and i thought that's a glance glance and blow and then obviously hernandez landed the killer shots that really messed the guy up but if you look at hernandez's fight outside of it as well uh he fought alan who is a top top guy with lfa at the time uh and he had a cracking fight in that one hernandez on the ground he can he can grapple on he can do stuff on the ground he's good on the ground as well as being on the feet he's got a good all-round skill set training with max griffin the pair of them are getting prepped together fighting together so it's a good mindset for the pair of them Perez for me if he gets space he's dangerous he can, he can throw some good kicks he throws some funky combinations sometimes it kind of don't kind of go together and it's just hard that it's just hard to put away I'm interested to see how Hernandez reacts when he hits Perez so I think he'll hit him and Perez doesn't maybe go down does Hernandez just go for broke and let it all out i haven't seen hernandez have that kind of fight and um, you know the lfa fight when this championship fight for the middle he went three rounds he did he did quite a bit there uh, i'm gonna go with both of them alive because hernandez is just one of those guys who can win but i'm gonna go with anthony hernandez because i think he's got a pop in his hands i uh, know i'm gonna go with hernandez sorry anthony hernandez i think he's got a pop in his hands i think he might stop him at perez second third round i think his hands can finally take a toll on perez i think perez just taking one too many hits in the fights of recent in his ufc time really uh so yeah i want to go with uh hernandez here but would not be shocked if perez won a good fight really really good fight i'm looking for this is one of the ones we're looking forward to and one of the reasons is it's because i have some money on the line in this fight here so um, yeah with like i say fluffy a guy that i've kind of someone I think you must have messaged me maybe a couple of years ago and told me about this guy coming up through the California kind of scene and West Coast Fighting Championship and Global Knockout, I think it was. Yeah. And uh, only really heard of him when he got to the LFA and he fought Brandon Allen, who Brendan Allen, I should say, who's a fairly decent fighter himself. And it's, uh, he was kind of on the UFC radar, I think, by being a champion in the LFA at that point. And then I heard he was coming on to the Dana White show and he's facing this Jordan Wright who uh, gets a lot of hate because he he grew up very, very rich, very, very privileged. And then Anthony Hernandez came out there and absolutely first kind of half-decent clean shot, wobbled him and then absolutely knocked him out clean with a a shot when he kind of had his arm tucked in there and came up through. And uh, yeah, I was wondering who he was going to get matched up with. This is a tough matchup. They're throwing him. A really, really tough fight here against Perez, who has shown his UFC career. He's he can take a he can take a hit. He can keep on coming. He's got no quit in him. He's got no uh, give up in him. And I mean, he's only got the one win in the UFC against James Botnovic, but he showed in that one there that he's got skills on the ground. If you, if you give him kind of positions where he has uh, potentially could have an advantage. Getting, getting in that position that, that he can put fights away. He showed that against Ian Heinish uh, when he won the LFA middleweight title. He's come into UFC and he's won a UFC fight. So, And he's beat Aldemir Alcantara, former UFC guy. Paulo Thiago, he's a former UFC guy. So um, the guy's got some decent experience and he's come in there and he's faced decent guys. I, I still think he had an opportunity to beat Andrew Sanchez in that fight last time out. It was just a little off. Sanchez, it changed up a little bit was better across the 15 minutes of the fight and that ultimately won him the fight. But he's still a dangerous guy. 
when I saw the betting odds for this one, Marcus Perez was a near two to one underdog. So I thought, all right, I'm going to go watch some some footage on this. And uh, I watched all of Anthony Hernandez's fights. And I, I don't want to say he's beaten cans because he's not. Um, but he is going through guys very kind of relatively quickly. And his opponents that he faced, like there was one guy, he, he was jaw, jaw jacking, just talking. He's got a terrible kind of record. And he comes out there and wants to touch gloves. And of course, Hernandez is not doing for that. And he throws in the first legitimate strike he hits him with. He uh, gets kind of, he hurts him and then he gets taken out of the fight. Um, and nothing just really stands out. You can see that he's dangerous. You can see he's, he's pretty crisp with his hands. But what I'm wondering is here, how can he, how can he go against a durable, durable guy? Now, Alan's a durable guy, but how, like, Perez is just a tough guy to put away. Tough guy to look good against. He's awkward. He, he throws awkward movements. Now, what I like with Hernandez is that he throws... Uh, he opens up his striking with a lot of feints. I like fighters with that. I always have. That kind of creates the openings where he can throw his big power strikes. Good right hook. Good right uppercut. Um, and he's got an excellent job of kind of landing elbows and strikes off the clinch as well. That's something I like. Big power. I, I can't really realize that much uh, when you go back and see some of these knockouts in the regional scenes you see that the guy's got some some big hands in him got some good wrestling uh, and most of these kind of takedowns come from the clinch and the few times that i've seen that and he's dangerous the one fight there the guy lowered his head into the guillotine five seconds later the guy's tapping now he didn't want any more of that uh so and his choke i think is his best weapon with his kind of grappling i just think that perez is going to be awkward i think the first round could be close I think if Hernandez hurts him, gets he gets the respect off Perez that he, um, that he'll be, be looking for, then he could potentially uh, look or be more confident in the later rounds against the guy like Perez. I don't think he's going to put him out there. I'd be super surprised if Hernandez came out there and knocked him out um, because Perez is shown he's durable and can take a hit. And, and, and at the odds that I saw him at plus one ninety, I thought I am all over this. Clear step up, um, clear step up in his career uh, against a tough, durable guy who could pose problems himself. The one thing I don't like with Perez is when he throws those big power strikes, he is open. Hernandez has got big power, could hurt him with that, um, which could change the kind of momentum of the fight, could really turn it in Hernandez's favour. Um, but I like Marcus Perez to win via decision here. I think the, the experience, the title experience against UFC caliber fighters is going to show here. And being an underdog like that, I, I like fighters like him who are hard to put away. Not really great in any one area, but you can show that he's dangerous with his strikes. He has a bit of a ground game. Um, and he's coming in against a guy. Now, these Dana White container show guys are getting big pushes. They're getting big fights straight off the bat now. And most of them, to be fair, are doing really well. I just think Marcus Perez is a tough fight for a young guy who's 6-7-0 in his career. Mm. Um, so I'm going to go Marcus Perez. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, like you say, like the thing like guys, they're yeah. just not, they're not giving them any warm up. They're just throwing them in, uh, which is kind of weird when you think about it. You think you got you got these guys, what you know, you some of them who don't make it into the show, they do development thing mm -hmm. on the regional, etc. And you think, well, why can't you do that kind of stuff in the UFC where you give them just fights, put them right under the radar, first fight in the prelims against a guy who's maybe on his way out of the UFC, a more suitable fight, but that's, uh, that's not us to decide, is it, Will? So, yeah. let's kick off the main card. A little bit excited here, Will. A little bit excited about this. Uh, a lady making her, well, both are making her UFC date, uh, step up to the UFC step. Livera, Renata, Souza against Sarah Frotter. Well, I cannot express how excited I am about Souza. Mm. Rather excited about Souza. Yeah. Because I think she's a, Fantastic talent. I'm yeah. super happy. Yeah. Um, yeah, Will, just tell me what you think is going to happen now in this fight. Uh, both girls are really, really dangerous fighters when you see them there. Like that, uh, Sarah Fro, I'd, I'd never really heard of her until the, obviously the Dana White show. And in fact, that's a lie. I did hear of her through, uh, what's the called? The SFL. And that was the fight before... Um, a Dana White contender show fight and 
I heard that she like SFL. I'm not I'm not really too familiar with it, but I know that you get certain points for finishes in fights, and her team I think were pretty crap, but she was the one that was keeping them in it by scoring these first round submissions or first round knockouts or whatever they were, um, and she did that. And you, you, I've watched a couple of fights there. She's I don't think she's an overly quick striker, but I think she's powerful. I think she's got that one. She's got. For, for a woman she can she can hit you once and that, that can hurt you but she's also shown she's really dangerous and she's very kind of versatile on the ground she works for her submissions really well she chains them together she doesn't just rush into them she looks for uh, her opportunities and, and just kind of like the Gunnar Nelson approach take little bits where you can where you can catch the submission don't rush it straight off I like fighters like that but she's facing someone in Livia Souza, who I I think I think she calls herself the the Brazilian gangster, oh. uh, and we've seen her and in Victor, very dangerous, dangerous fighter herself. The only kind of chinks in her armor that we've kind of seen was Angela Hill stop takedowns uh, and uh, kind of hurt her on the feet a little bit. That was a close back and forward fight. She got the easiest UFC debut against Alex Chambers. Alex Chambers is not a UFC caliber fighter, never has been, and she got her out of there in the first round. I think on the feet. Um, I think I don't know whether she wants to really stand with Sarah Throat on the feet. I think Throat is dangerous up there. When it comes to the ground, I think that Souza is better. But I'm going out a limb there and saying, who knows? Because from what I've seen of Throat, she looks like she's got a vast array of submissions. She's very strong. And uh, once she gets into that dominant position, she's hard to get off you. So, uh, I like Livia Souza. But honestly, I'm not overly confident in the pick. I think I can't remember what her betting line is, but I think she's a hefty favourite, and I don't really agree with that too much because Frota, uh, she looks like she can get you on the feet and she can get you on the ground, and those kind of fighters are um, kind of dangerous. But I think she's making uh, a big step up an opponent again as well. So it's like who knows? But I'm going to go Olivia Souza. Be a very kind of hard 15 minute fight. I think she's going to take a licks. In this one here, but I think she wins the fight. But like I said, I'm not really confident in, in the like betting this fight or so on. I think that Frota could have an opportunity in a road to kind of win the fight, but I like Souza. Well, yeah, I has done a lot of grappling, a lot of grappling comps, and outside of MMA, and she's done really well. So she's she has got legitimate grappling skills. Mm. My only issue with Frota on, on the stand up is she has got power. But she's not very good at aiming. And what I mean by that is she misses quite a lot of heavy shots. Like in that like for example, the Dana White show, she actually fought that girl in that the fight before in the SFL. Like so like she yeah. fought the same girl twice, which is yeah. weird. And she still ma messed her up. So I was like, well that sounds like a dumb idea anyway. Why'd you put her in again? And she got mashed up again. You thought, well, whatever, is what is it. But what I found was when she did hurt her opponent, she isn't technically very good standing to turn take her apart because she took a while to finish her off. When she rocked her with the left, but what she didn't do was she didn't bring herself into range. She rocked the girl and she was throwing punches and missing quite a lot. And then she was finally catching her and she was getting tired herself. You know, the girl obviously was hurt and rocked, but she throws her chin out on strikes. So if you ever if you're watching her when she's punching, she'll be all she'll have her shoulders rolled up how you should do, and then when she punches, she comes up every time, every time she comes up. I don't know why she's doing it. It grinds me. It oh it gets under my skin so bad. I'm like just it's not hard to just punch, keep your bloody chin down. How, why she does it, I don't know. I don't know why you think that is a good idea. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But then if, again, if you look at it when she gets. If you look at it when someone throws strikes back at her, she does the same thing again. She's not doing the small thing, keeping her shoulders, chin tucked in, and just parrying shots or maybe blocking. She's leaning back with her chin up. She leans back and puts her chin out, and it's open. So if I'm a coach and I'm watching this, that's my thing about Sarah Frotta. I thought, if she's going to throw strikes, all you have to do is a bit of footwork, footwork, slight angle, both of you are coming in, yeah, slight angle, and at counter shots. Just a slight angle of counter, and you could really hurt Sarah Frotter because she's open for the counters. 
because the chin is just oh it's just there and especially if you're coming at Potter, double up on your strikes so throw a jab and a right straight and then throw a second right straight on that second right straight you step forward you close the gap that right that chin's going to be there or the chin's going to be on its way down and you'll connect you'll connect every time or if you throw a jab watch your lean back with the chin and then loop around with a hook it's there it's it's there again so if if, if Soros's coaches had looked at the tape study enough of her and got the drill on these simple little movements she is there to counter and if i was Sosa, i'd be countering sarah that would be my game plan don't bother trying to initiate the striking just count her the strikes and you could you could hurt her but for Sosa, i would yeah i would try to get top control on the game i think Sosa is a bit more active like if you look at the angel hill fight it was a good one the pair of them were just especially especially since the angel hill fight as well you have seen it as well will his striking has come on so his striking has developed as well but angela hill fight was a really good fight for her it showed that she needed to develop her striking she couldn't rely on grappling only she had to go and work and she has she clearly had since then in evicted in when she's an evicted worked on her striking and she's starting to blend it all i think she's starting to come up a lot leaps and bounds since then because some, sometimes fighters need that fight to lose to see where their holes are and you saw that angela hill was just quicker to the punch, just quicker combination, just just getting there every time. And I think Souza will be quicker with the striking. And I think she can catch Boza, uh, Frotter with the speed. Speed is where I think she can win here. I think Frotter's a bit too slow. When it comes to the grappling, Souza get on top. I'm going to go decision win for Souza. But yeah, Frotter's just a, 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 a tough one. If, if you stand there and give it a chance, she'll hit you. But if you just use a bit of speed, which these straw weights should be really quick, mm-hmm. you're laughing. Like Alex Chambers would be Christmas day to Frotter because she wouldn't move enough. Or Ronda Marcos, she'd just get lit up by it. Um, but yeah, that's that's where I see that going. Next up, I think it's going to be a pretty short, quick analysis. Johnny Walker, who's going to have a huge hype train behind him, let's be honest. Dana White's going to be le- leaping all over this kid. Uh, Justin Ledette. Um, Justin back in the light heavyweight, staying down there. Will, how do you... I don't know, it's me now, sorry. You yeah. did last. Post. Now, I'm Johnny Walker again. Uh, I think Johnny Walker... I, I'm, I'm going with Johnny Walker against Justin here because it's pretty short and quick. Justin, good boxing. Don't get me wrong. He has got good boxing. He hasn't adapted his boxing well enough for MMA. And what I mean by that is you can be a good boxer but if you try to use just pure boxing in MMA, it doesn't work. You have to adapt it so it's a bo- it's an MMA style boxer. You know, your stance has to be different. And I just think it's not enough. You know, when you he needs to incorporate more than just punches. Kicks need to be involved. He doesn't. He's actually not too. So I on the ground actually, uh, even though he tapped out Mark Godbeer, which is not something to write home about mark godbeer knows he, he's not a grappler mark godbeer is not a submission artist he never has been never will be he'll happily admit that and uh, also he had problems with his neck for years so when he got the rear naked choke on it probably isn't something he's, a, he's overly happy with having on him uh johnny walker just big dude for like heavyweight man like i am looking forward to him and like someone like Matic or so I'm looking forward to some fights for Johnny Walker but I think Walker's going to put Ledette away I think he's just going to have a clinch work to him the, the striking is there Ledette's not going to take it down I, I, I just don't see where Ledette's going to stop because Walker can throw punches but he can throw kicks and knees and elbows Ledette doesn't really offer that much offense compared he offers good boxing very good boxing good jab so I expect Ledette to throw a good jab but I just think Walker's going to be more offensive. I just don't see where Ledette can find the find opportunity. And I think Walker's just going to put him away. I, I want to go like maximum second round. Could see a first round finish for Johnny Walker, but don't see Ledette often much more. Mm. Uh, I want to be, I picked, I think I picked him last time against Khalil Roundtree and I felt really stupid for not baiting him uh, because he went in there and like uh, once he caught Khalil and he tied Khalil up, oh, he started ripping him. He absolutely started ripping him with elbows, and you could hear the thuds they were making. And I, after I think it was the third one that he hit him, where they fell and he he went down. Um, 
when you watch the, the one thing, and this is the worst thing we watch in fights. If you go back and watch some of Johnny Walker's losses, he sometimes his fight IQ goes completely out the window. And he comes rushing forward. And there's one fight, I can't remember his opponent's name, but he pretty much got knocked out three times in one fight. He got hit with a big shot coming forward, put down, got back up, got hit again, tried to get back up, and then got put down again. Um, uh, so, yeah, that kind of scares me. But Justin Day is not one of these guys that throws huge combinations. He, he really wants to use and establish that jab. He, he comes from the boxing background, which a jab is a massive essential tool in your arsenal. Um, and he has got a great jab, there's no doubt about it. But I just think that this guy is going to mix it up a little bit with leg kicks. I think Rakic showed the best way to beat this guy is mixing it up. Rakic was the better striker, took the respect away from Lede. Uh, I think he actually came out of that fight and st like straight away started peppering with leg kicks. And Lede hated that. Being a boxer, his footwork's very kind of rudimental and stationary, not great, especially a heavyweight boxer. Um, and then he, he started getting lit up with the hands. And then he started getting taken down by Rakic as well because he just couldn't stop him in any facet of the game. Uh, I'm a little bit cautious with Johnny Walker. I still think there's going to be somewhere along the line where he's going to get hot, hit with just one shot and he's going to be out. I don't think this is going to be the fight because I don't think Ledet is going to throw enough shots in the combination side of things to really hurt him. Now, I don't know whether how well that's going to score with the Brazilian judges with him just racking up points with his jab. Depending on how good the jab is, if the jab hits a lot and it lands a lot, then they could score it. I just think when he throws that jab, he's going to be open to a body kick, a leg kick, um, and he's going to he's going to get countered off that. And if he starts tying up with Walker, we've seen that this guy is very dangerous, and we've seen, I think it was Stuart Austin, he was actually over here in the UK, caught him in the clinch with a beautiful knee, back against the cage, uh, and knocked him out with that. I'm going to go Johnny Walker by knockout as well. I'm just a little bit, I don't know, the depth's kind of thrown me off because... I think if he if he establishes his job well and he maybe flusters Johnny Walker a little bit, he might make Johnny Walker get too aggressive where he comes forward and could potentially hit a bigger shot uh, than he really needs to. And again, those past fights where I've seen him knocked out a few times kind of sits in my head a little bit. But I don't think this is going to be the fight for that. I'm going to pick Johnny Walker via knockout. I think he gets him into clinch, maybe starts going to the body with knees, gets those elbows, and I think he'll finish him kind of from there. He'll drop down and finish with ground and pound. So... I'll go Johnny Walker via TKO. Yeah, I think the light heavyweight division is some matchups there for suitable for Johnny Walker, but like yeah. people against Reyes, he'd just be having a nightmare. There's yeah. certain guys in that light heavyweight division who just you know, have a rough time with. Yeah. Uh, next up, well, I won't lie, I was a bit, I was a bit confused about this matchup, uh, but it's been made. Uh, Charles Oliveira, David Tamer, I was. And it's not, I'm not trying to put a downer on Tamer either. Nothing wrong with Tamer. Legit, legit guy, legit lightweight. I just thought um, Oliveira would have got someone a little bit higher because of, you know, in his career, he's not done too bad. But um, I suppose they are kind of maybe at similar stages in the lightweight, lightweight division. Um, interesting fight, man. Yeah. We know, we love the Tamers. They're, they're there's just two dudes that bring it. What do you see in David and what do you see in Charles here? Uh, it's kind of, I don't know. I still think that David Tamer, you can see that he's got skills that he's trying to mould into a fighter. He's a kickboxer, he's a Muay Thai guy. And he's very slick in the feet and very, very fast with his combinations. I just don't think that's going to work here. If he doesn't catch Oliveira early, now the thing is with Oliveira, sometimes you don't know what guy is going to turn up. The guy maybe takes one strike and he's like, he falls down. You're like, oh, you're not too sure about that. And Tamar has the kind of speed and power. Well, maybe not so much the power. He's got the speed to maybe really fluster Charles Oliveira. He puts himself into that mindset and it, all it takes is one shot and he'll, he'll, he'll dive down. He'll, he'll quit easy. And that's kind of me. That's kind of, that's a bit shitty to say because uh, Charles Oliveira is one of the, one of the most fun, fun fighters to watch. And has been over the years for a long, long time. But David Tamer, his his game plan for this fight is not tangle up with Oliveira and just don't get caught in any um, situations. Because if, if he gets caught up, I 100% think that Charles Oliveira is going to find a submission in this guy. I still think he's very 
uh, not that experienced still in the sport. And I mean, his run of wins is really good. Venata, Venata is there to be hit though. That's something that you've seen through every Lando Venata fight. He's there to be hit. He can be picked apart. Uh, the faster, speedier guy, his head movements, his head doesn't move. You can jab the head off him. You can hit him, run, move. Um, Drakkar Close, I thought, was a great win. Stopped him getting his hands on him. Stopped him putting him against the cage and winning winning the fight through that. And then Nick Lentz was just too slow. He wasn't fast enough to compete with someone like David Tamer. Uh, and then he's getting someone like Charles Oliveira, who's, I think he's got the most submission wins in the UFC. And But one thing with Charles, which I always think we'll underappreciate with the guys, his striking's not that bad. He's a long striker. Um... And uh, he can keep you at length with his jab, deep kicks, but he uses all that to get in a position where he can with you. And if he can get in a position where he can grapple with you, you're in deep, deep trouble. And I think this is, you look at Jim Miller, uh, I think he only fought him like December. Jim Miller's a black belt, a definite black belt. He's shown in the past that he is. But once Charles Oliveira just gets the inkling, uh, gets the arm in the right position or whatever it may be, you're going to be tapping out. I don't care who you are. David Tamer is nowhere near on the level of some of the guys that he's fought ground-wise, grappling-wise. He's going to be in deep shit if he gets caught in anything uh, here. And I just don't see him picking and prodding for 15 minutes of this fight. I don't see I think there's going to be a time when he's going to get caught up uh and then he's going to get submitted. I really do. I think that if he gets put against the cage, any inkling of him going to the ground, I think Charles is going to drown him. But the thing is with Charles Oliveira, you don't know. He could take a couple of shots and just not do anything. And that's the thing that kind of scares me with that guy. I'm going to go Charles Oliveira via submission. He The line the lines in this fight have changed. He was, uh, I think initially he was a favourite. Then he was a massive underdog. Now he's the favourite again. So the line's flipping. Now David Tamer's a... Uh, an underdog and it wouldn't surprise me if it kind of moves again the way this fight's going so it's weird uh, i'm going to pick charles Oliveira. i'm going to pick him via sub i think there's just going to be a time in this fight where he catches him and he submits him i just think that he's light years ahead of what do it's probably he's probably forgot years worth of stuff that tamer will never ever learn never even get close to learn i just think that Oliveira, if he turns up in the right mindset like we've seen him do in the past he, I think he should win this fight and he'll win it via submission. So I'm going to go Charles Oliveira for the win there. Yeah, Tim is a really exciting guy. Yeah. You know, he is fun to watch, like you say. He and he is 100% a fighter. Great to watch. The Nick Lentz fight was a good one to see how, because I, I was curious about how does he cope with guys who are going to try to take him down. And I think Nick Lentz is the, probably the best example you can find out there. Um, and he did really well in that Nick Lentz fight. He did really well with keeping the distance. And you can saw it as soon as Nick got anywhere, got uh, Tamer anywhere close to getting his back near the cage, Tamer was just gone. He was just out. He knew. He knew his surroundings, knew where he was. Um, so I, I have confidence in Tamer being able to avoid. Because even when Nick Lenz tried to grapple with him, you know, Tamer was quick to disengage, create space, jab, anything. So I, I, at first, like you say, well, I think at first Tamer can handle it for for the first round at least, maybe. Uh, or at least for the first three minutes, I think he'll have the speed to get around. Charles Oliveira, the advantage Charles has, he is quite long. So what he, Charles is very smart. He's very smart, like I said. He does use that range. But what he does is he uses those long kicks and jabs because he keeps you on the end of his strikes because you're still losing that round. It doesn't matter that he's not got you in a sub. You're losing that round if you're on the end of his shots. So it forces you to close in on him to get strikes in because he's keeping you on the end. And when you close in on him, that's what he wants because he just wants you close. Because if he can, he'll take you down. Or if not, we've seen before, he'll just pull guard. And no thanks. There's one guy, Paul Felder, has handled his guard well. Not an eye attack. Look, just, just handled it. Like, Felder could have easily got submitted in that bout. It was like... I. I I was on sitting there and I obviously go watch Duke Rufus as well. He's like, what are you doing going this guard? It was insane. And he somehow made out. Tamer's not the full Felder kind of ground and pound level. Like ground and pound that Paul Felder's got is power. Like disgusting good power. Tamer hasn't got it. I think Tamer gets caught. 
I'm going to give Tamer some respect. I think he can get the first round. He's going to be lively, moving around. I'm going to the second round still submission for Oliveira. And it sounds cheeky. I'm giving him respect, but I think he's got enough to get out the first round. I think Charles can figure him out in between rounds. His corner especially will say, look, he's doing this, he's doing this. Just figure that out. You'll close him down. You'll get him down. And I think I think Tamer gets to submit. And, and you're right, Will. Like, Charles is light years away. Like, Charles Oliveira is like an alien compared to David Tamer when it comes to Jiu-Jitsu. Um, so Tamer can obviously, he'll do so much, but it's just the chains that Oliveira has but from one submission to the next. It's just a relentless chain of submission attempts. And you're just constantly trying to fight one after another and you just can't keep up with it. Uh, it's beautiful watching Charles Oliveira on the ground. Like I, I hope every time he fights, he goes to the ground because I want to see it happen. But uh, yeah, I won Charles with submission as well, second round. And next up, welterweight fight. Uh, Damian Meyer. Uh, Layman Good. Oh. Damian Meyer. Is this potentially a retirement fight for him? He's in Brazil, in his home, in, not his hometown, but he's, in, he's at home, so to speak, Brazil. He's 41. That title fight has happened. He didn't win the title. Um, he's now lost, what was it, three or something in a row. He's had the worst three stylistic opponents you could have asked for in like the top elite guys in that welterweight division for for uh, wrestlers. So I feel pretty bad on to, to David Meyer. Like it was just one guy after another. Um, but somehow no one's finished him still. Like none of them have finished him. Like, he's got a head like a coconut. How, how have they not stopped him? It's just oh, mental. My only concern, though, is good is looking good. You know, um, he's a, a very experienced fighter. For people who, I know he got the ban, um, but when he was in Bellator, he fought the, the who's who in Bellator. Like, he fought top, top guys in Bellator. Um, Kojite, uh, you know, what's his name again? Great yes, guy, Kojkov, that's it, sorry. Um, Rick Horn, now Rick Horn has retired since, but but when when him and Rick Horn fought, Rick Horn was a badass, welterweight in that, in that Bellator division, um, top, top guy. Uh, he fought Mike Dolce as well, good, back in the day, which I thought was funny. I look at his record, uh, uh, what was it, Saturday or something like that, I was looking at his record. So he fought in Bellator. Uh, so he's fought like you know some great names. Beat Jimmy Warhead back in the day in, in Bellator too. So he's fought some good names. Uh, the Ben Saunders fight. Well, nah. If you don't, if no, if you can't stop Ben Saunders these days, these days you're never going to make it. It's the best way to put it. Um, I just, I'm just curious about what, how. Good's going to handle a takedown offense from Damian Meyer because Good's strong. Like he sees a physic physical specimen. Good camp physical specimen. He's looking. Da he's dangerous on the feet. But Damian Meyer, when he loses, he loses to the top top guys. When do you see Damian Meyer lose to the guys who are like? I don't know if. Good is ranked. I don't know if he's ranked in the top 15, to be honest with you. I don't know what the rankings are. When do you see Maya lose to guys who aren't like top echelon? Even though he's 41, I've got a weird, sneaky feeling that Maya can get good down. And when Maya's on you, we've seen it before, he's just like glue. I was, when I first saw the fight, I was picking good straight away. I thought, mate, Maya's done maybe. But it's only because Maya fought the, the best there is, like, at the moment, Usman, Colby, and your man Tyrell. Like, he fought three absolute top echelon, top, top, top of the range well weight guys you can get. I'm going crazy. A lot of people might, I don't know, I don't know what the odds are for this fight. You, you'll know yourself well, probably you've seen the odds. I'm going to go Maya. I think Maya could submit good, because Maya's just a ninja. He is a Charles Oliveira of the welterweights. Mm hmm and um, I'm going to go with Maya submission because I just think he's he just gets guys like good and wins. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he is a favourite. Damon Maya is a favourite. Pretty handily, I think, as well. But um, 
I mean, I, I've Lyman Good physically looks scary as, as you know what, um, but I just think this is a bad matchup for him. I don't think he's going to be able to top the stop the takedowns against. If I don't if he, if he knock out Maya. We know what Damon's going to do. He's going to keep coming forward. He did against Tyron Woodley. Kept coming forward, look for a takedown every opportunity he gets. And he's not he's not a Tyron Woodley. He's not going to stop getting taken down. And I think once he gets down there, it's that old case like Neil Magny, uh, when he faced him. Neil Magny did not have a clue what to do and couldn't do anything until he got submitted. Lyman Good might have a little bit more. And from that, Neil Magny went on and he became a pretty decent fighter all around with his ground skills as well. Um, so yeah, for me, it's kind of knock out a bus for good. And then Damien Maya has to get the fight to the ground. But I just see the more, the biggest probability coming from Damien Maya getting these takedowns. Uh, I think this is going to be the last fight <clears throat> that Damien Maya fights. I think if he wins this one, I think he goes out. I think he's not going to get the title shot. He's not going to go back up to 185 where there's killers up there. Um, I just don't see him doing that. I think he's looking for a win. I think he's looking for like a Dennis Bermudez type moment like he, from the last card. And he can go out in his home country with another maybe submission win. I just struggle. And I, I've been trying to look into Lyman Good and thinking, right, has he an opportunity? And he has because he's got big power. And he can, if he was to hit Maya with the right shot, he could potentially fall up with ground and pound. But even that's dangerous against someone like Maya. So... I just think Damien Meyer's going to find a way to get him to the ground and then from there, nobody competes with that guy in the ground. Doesn't matter. Gunnar Nelson, I thought, could compete with him. Gunnar Nelson wasn't even in his realm. No, it was insane, wasn't it? Yeah, I couldn't I, I could not get, I couldn't grasp it. Yeah. I couldn't watch it live. I was like... I thought Gunnar Nelson was going to... I thought he was going to show he was the best guy in the ground and he's not even close to what Damien Meyer is. <laughs> not even close. Not even <laughs> what a bad yeah. But when we watched Gunnar Nelson and he went through all these guys on the ground, yeah. do you imagine being those guys thinking, if Damien minded that to you, yeah. what would he do to me? And Gunnar, Gunnar would yeah, Gunnar would do it to anybody else, I think, in the division. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But Damien Maya, he couldn't touch that guy. So wow. different levels. The guy's probably the best jujitsu guy in the game that we've had come into the UFC and, and I mean he doesn't really get that many submissions but he is facing the top top guys in the divisions now so uh, when he came in he was getting all these submissions because people didn't really know about him um, but then once they figured out who he was they realised that you can't go to the ground with this guy you've got to strike with him, you've got to do this and eventually he kind of got found out and the, the game plan is out there to beat Damien Maia Lyman Good I just don't think he's got the game to stop Damien Maia doing what he wants to do so I'm going to pick Damien Maia Via submission, I think it's. I do think it'll be the last time we see him in the UFC. Nice, nice. Okay, well, uh, next up we're going to go with coming event on a fight night card. It's. I, I won't lie, Will. I'm still kind of torn on this one, but Jose Aldo against Renato Meccano, who, mate, what a great fight matchup yeah. this is. What a great matchup. So I think Aldo's only got, is it two more fights or three after this? Two more fights left on his contract. And then that's him. So he's only got this and then two more, I think, or something like that. So he's not got left on his contract. He said he's not going to continue with the UFC anyway because he wants to do a boxing career pursuit or something like that he talked about. Um, but Will, what a, what a hell of a scrap that is for a co-main event. Yeah, it is a really good fight. Uh, I think it's smart on... Aldo, this was offered up as a main event, I think, somewhere over five rounds. I think over five rounds, I think Moicano beats him. 90, well, 90 out of 100 times, I think that he beats him. I think he fights smart. Over three rounds, I think Aldo realises that he's got more on opportunity. And uh, I just want to say, like, his win last year and the way he won with that shot is one of my favourite things of 2018 because he got hit with a shot early in that round and it... it you can you can see with Josie Alden now when he gets hit with a shot, his like meter it's kind of like a Mortal Kombat. You get hit with a shot, your meter kind of drains, and you can see that he deteriorates, he wilts a little bit. But you cannot take that guy for granted because he's got such fast hands, he's got such fast uh, speed with his combinations and everything that all it takes is one shot, and he showed one shot, and it shut down Jeremy Stevens 
where he couldn't even, he just didn't want, he could hit Stevens anywhere else, he just didn't want him to hit the body. And he, he rolled over, he was he was protecting that mid drift. Uh, and uh, Aldo got a massive win. Uh, Mike Hano, I love Mike Hano. I absolutely love Hanato Maikano. I love his his whole entire skill set. I think his striking is dangerous, but it's not technical. I think it, it kind of... I don't want to say it's loopy, looping shots, because I don't think it is, but it's a little bit loopy, but not like technical straight jab, da-da-da. He has got a great jab on him, though. He, he dropped Cub Swanson with a beautiful jab in the last fight. And then after that, Cub Swanson, he got kind of ate up in the ground a little bit uh, and got taken out by submission. But... All around a good striker, smart, smart fighter as well. I always go back and watch the Brian Ortega fight. Um, and he lost that fight. He made one mistake. And that happens with Brian Ortega. You can make that one mistake with that guy and he's going to take you out. But over, I think, th those two rounds, he was fighting smart, picking his shots right, then going in for takedowns and getting the takedowns. Just this one time he went in for a takedown, he left his neck in there. And against T-City, you're, you're in deep, deep shit. Um, so I'm kind of wondering... What Mike Cano's game plan is going to be here? <clears throat> I think he has to play safe early on when Aldo's at his most freshest. Um, because I do think he, I don't want to say he depletes as the fight goes on. I think if you land bots on him, you can definitely see his, his damage meter going down. Um, but he's always dangerous. Max Holloway did the perfect thing there. He kind of just fought and hit him with some shots. But once he got him hurt, like he always does, he just kind of raised the bar kept on going and he couldn't he couldn't really keep up with Max Holloway in that kind of instant. Uh, I think it's a trap fight for anybody betting it and I really want to pick who I was going to pick in this fight. I want to bet this fight but I don't think I can because I think Aldo <laughs> in Brazil is a trap fight. I think I'm going to I'm going to pick Canato Maicano um, but this is a trap fight because if this fight's close in Brazil I really think they're going to give Jose Aldo the decision because he's a i just got that feeling in my body that if it goes to a decision and it's very close, my, uh, my Cano's not going to get the nod in this one and it's dangerous for him there. Outside of that, I think if he fights smart, maybe gets a takedown. Now, Aldo's got one of the best takedown uh, defences in the whole entire game, so that's not going to be easy. So he's going he's gonna to have to stand with someone like um, Aldo. He just has to be careful and don't get caught. If you get caught against Aldo and he starts flurrying you, you're in deep trouble. Um, so I'm kind of banking on my Cano getting into the later part of this fight and winning the fight through then. Maybe potentially getting a, getting a takedown, hurting him through that and depleting Aldo a little bit. But if this stays standing for 15 minutes, I think you have to maybe favour Aldo. Maybe. And maybe I'm disrespecting my Cano's skills a little bit, but it's just because Aldo is so dangerous on there that, and he's so quick, and he comes out of nowhere with some of these strikes that he could, he could, he could take you out. Like I said, I think it's a trap fight. I want to bet my Cano so bad his line is coming down. He's like minus one twenty five, and he's came down from minus one seventy. Um, so that line by fight time might be a pick him. But the best thing to do is stay away, not unless you see confidence in one guy here. Uh, I just think it's a trap fight for my Cano. A big fight for him against the legend. Um, over five rounds, I'd probably bet my Cano. Three rounds, oof, I'm staying away. I'm staying out of the road of that one. I'm going to pick my Cano via... Um, actually, I think he's going to knock him out in the third round. I think he's going to knock out Jose Aldo. I think that's the way you can deplete Jose Aldo um, of, his, of his everything that he's got and then just take him out. So I'm going to go a third round TKO for, for Hanato Maicano. It's a horrible one to pick. Maybe well, it's. Yeah. I, I I was uncomfortable trying to pick a winner mm. in this fight because it's Jose Aldo. You know, it's the best way to put it. Like he only lost to the best. Like he only lost to, like you say, elite guys. And is Hanato the fu a future guy who's going to be in that? You know, t is if Hanato wins this one, does he maybe get a title fight? Because yeah. we saw the yeah. we saw the yeah. peer. Yeah, we saw the PR gold that Max Holloway has done of late. Going to Jameson's distillery, going to yeah. Crow Park. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely fantastic work. Obviously, there's talks about Cerrone and uh, McGregor. So, you know, is is Max Holloway taking an opportunity to maybe try and have a fight at 155 against Connor? No belt on the line. Have a one. Connor's not doing 145 ever again. So. 
you know, is that a chance? And maybe if Max does that, that's his gateway into the 155 division to say, look, right, let's go. Give me, mm -hmm. give me Khabib after. Yeah. I think Max could fight Khabib right now if he wanted to. I don't think Dana could deny it if he wanted to go to 155 and do a, a title fight. <clears throat> but besides that, let's look at what we've got right now. We've got Jose Aldo, who is, you know, he is quest questionable on the chin. <clears throat> Obviously, with that, you know, not only getting stopped by Conor, but it was the Max Holloway fight, really, that was, was, was the key factor. Because so obviously anyone can get clipped like he did against McGregor. But what happened in the Max Holloway fight, it wasn't one punch. It was just punch after punch after punch and after. And it, that was, that's wear and tear. So he, he just got an absolute beating on him twice by Holloway. That's mm -hmm. the worst thing you want. It's not that it happened once. The, the, the best way I can represent it is uh, Junior Santos against Cain Velasquez. After they fought the first time, look at what happened after. Junior Santos got mauled by Cain after that. And it just wasn't the same fighter. You know, you notice it yourself. Well, yeah. Junior Santos changed, changed, changed the way he fights, the way everything it just wasn't the same. You looked at the Jeremy Stevens fight with Jose Aldo. He got rocked early. And you also everyone saw it, everyone went, whoa. And we know Jeremy hits hard, but like Josie was rocked early in that first round. Don't get me wrong, that body shot was pure delight, like you say. But was that due to maybe Jeremy Stevens not taking full advantage and just keeping the pressure on? You've got to you've got to understand Josie Aldo's gonna fight back. If he gets hurt, he's gonna punch and throw hard back. You just have to do what Holloway did. Use your range. Be smart. Don't stay stationed. If you hit, if, if Moicano lands on Aldo early and hurts him, don't just stand there to trade. Land the shot, cut the angle, land the shot, and just keep hitting and moving, hitting and moving, and that's how you'll you'll get it. Three-round fight, not comfortable. I, I, I'm really uncomfortable. Five rounds, like you say, I think Josie Aldo will be good for the first couple, and then Hanato could have a, start having advantage of it. Because Hanato, Jose Aldo's not fighting Frankie Edgar anymore. When the Frankie Edgar fight, he fought him enough times, knew what Frankie was like, and also was could use the jab to just wreck up Edgar's day. Hanato, I think, can land some good shots. He's just got to be wary of Jose Aldo's power and hand speed and combinations of the leg kicks. The leg kicks are very, very few, few and far between these days. Hanato's not going to go for the takedown. He's got to be smart. It's a waste of energy. I don't think it's just, if I was fighting Aldo, I would not be wasting my energy on it. I'd be throwing a lot of feints, a lot of feints, just to see what I can get Aldo to open up and see what opens up and go for it. Um, and I, but I would take a lot of note from the Aldo, uh, the Holloway fights. High output, pressure, angles. Don't let Aldo breathe. Just keep Aldo under immense pressure. And that's what's shown he can, he can do quite a lot of that. Um, and I've, Will, I'm like you. I've got a lot of got high ceiling for Hanato. He's a fantastic addition, fantastic guy in this weight, featherweight division. Uh, but it's Josie Aldo. Uh, I will split decision, Moicano, but I hate to pick either one because it's horrible. It's a horrible fight to pick. Because Aldo could end it, end it in a couple of strikes, if he, or, or he could just put a clinic on for three rounds. If you went like old school, like Mark Hominick style, mm. where you just lit Hominick up in the first few rounds. But yeah, I love my kind of free split decision, but it's horrible. Horrible. Uh, next up, we have in the bantamweight division, Will. A rematch. Happy on the Sands at Sun Tau against Marlon Moraes. Uh, let's talk about the first time they fought. Uh, super technical fight. Really close. Um, Marlon was making his debut. One thing that I thought that stood out in that fight was Marlon Moraes' tempo and movement in the first round never was replicated. Didn't do, it, didn't do the same thing in the second or third. Now, that confused me because I thought I wasn't sure who won the first round, but he was having success. And I think if you're having success, don't take it away, just add to it. Now, I'm sure his corner was saying, what are you doing? What, why are you changing this up? Stick to what you were doing. Um, so I was a bit confused on that. Us and Sal, since then, 
like he had that weird freaky win over Aljamain Sterling. And what I mean by freaky win, folks, is he was actually going to throw a leg kick, and it was just timing that he was throwing a leg kick as Aldo was going, as Aljamain was going for a takedown. And then it's just the, the kind of find the knee hit Aldo, uh, Aljamain. So, Aljamain, sorry. So it wasn't an intentional kick to the head to knock him out. He was just going for a kick. It was just the fact that Aljamain sadly went into it. So it was a weird one, that. So I know everyone was like, oh, and I was like, oh, these happen. I, I've, I've had my cheekbone chipped. So I, I shot him for a takedown on my training partner, and he jumped in with a flying knee. You know, so he was going for a flying knee on me. I got a chip on the cheekbone because I was shooting him for takedown. So I, I, I'm with um, Aljamain on that. I didn't get knocked out because, you know, solid. Uh, but, yeah, I, I thought I was the Jimmy Rivera one. Stronger performance, getting the finish there against Rivera. Uh, the Dodson fight was a strange one as well because he got the split decision, but it wasn't a great fight. Dodson just isn't the same guy as well for some reason in there. You know, I think Dodson's got a big chance. He's got he's got the opportunity to be the old self against Peter Yan. If he doesn't, I'm curious about what Dodson does these days. But uh, anyway, that's by the by. I thought it was a bit of a weird one. He got a split decision. But in that Aston Sal fight, Aston Sal can pop. And we saw him rock Morais in the first round, and especially in the third. And, and he lands he lands good counter strikes. Aston Sal's got good counters. He's got good movement. I think he just, it's a five round fight this time, whereas before it was a three round fight. Will the leg kicks, if he lets them, if he lets them land, because obviously we're not going to get the same fight we did last time. Absolutely not. It's going to be a different fight. They both have different tactics for each other. If you look at Aston Sal, didn't really go for many take. He went for one takedown. It didn't work. He, he switched it off straight away and pushed Morais onto the floor as he broke off, which is really great. Morais went for a takedown with a single leg, and Aston Sal did some magician work to get out of it. <laughs> I, I need to watch it back because I want to do what he did. I was like, what is he doing? Like, it was like he was spiraling in midair as he put as well. I think Morais like what? Yeah. I'm like, what is that? Yeah, you know it's you know it's impressive when Dominic Cruz is saying like he couldn't believe what he saw. So, oh, yeah. I was I couldn't. But honestly, I'm watching. Um, I, I obviously I watched the fight a while back, but you forget like about an escape for that. And you think, what is that? It's fantastic. Anyway, Asun Sal, great, great. He's a, he's a absolutely incredible bantamweight. Like, he's done so well in the division. Injuries messed his career up, but on by the by, he is testament chin. He's got a hell of a chin, right? Great chin, good power, good technique. He's just a solid bantamweight fighter. It gripes me that they don't give a title fight. They haven't still given him a title fight because on paper, you think about well, he beat Rice and he's still got a fight again. But over a five five round fight, it's going to be. I think it's going to be completely different. I think. Marais needs to land more leg kicks because they will have an effect on him in the third round. That's some sound that's starting to take a toll. Land a few more leg kicks. The only problem is he's opening himself for the counter right hand, which Aston Sal landed. And then also in the third round, Aston Sal was starting to time the leg kicks. So we went for a take, uh, went to try and catch one. So it's a tough one. It, it's a, this fight's really hard to call. It's really tight. I, I would go with Aston Sal again. I want to partly go with Morais, but I'm just wondering how Morais will do in the five round fight. Because I think in the first round he looked great and he tapered off in the second and third against. He did bring it on a little bit more in the third round against Aston Sal, but I think Aston Sal kind of just felt comfortable in won it, maybe. I want to see what kind of pace Aston Sal could maybe keep. If, as long as he keeps Marlon Morais on the back foot like he did in the first two rounds, just keep the pace on it. I want to see how Morais does in the third, fourth and fifth round. I want to see it get to there. I want to see what his condition is like, how he does, how he performs. Because um, he got cut up in that fight. His nose was cut. I think it was cut up against the eyebrow as well because of the power that Austin Sal had. You know, is he open a bit more in the fourth and fifth round, Morais, to Aston Sal's counter rights? I want to go decision win for Aston Sal only because he's done it before. He's a... Um, and... 
he just doesn't get the credit he should. As some how he always gets overlooked by every time he goes in, he's always overlooked. I just find that I can't overlook. I haven't overlooked him for a long time, and I think a lot of people do. I just can't overlook him again. And I just think Asim Sal will somehow do what he does best and get that win, decision win. You know, go. And, uh, but it's going to be way different than the first. Hmm. It's a hard, this is another hard fight to pitch. I'm a fan of Rafael Asim so and, and it's not because there's fighters out there you're obviously fans of, like exciting fighters. And I'm not saying he's not exciting. He's a workman-like fighter, but he's so good in a lot of aspects of the game. And for for opponents, you need to be the kind of the elite of the elite to really look good against that guy and beat that guy. And his record shows that um, if you're on a similar level, or maybe you think you're better than this guy, he he will show you that his all-around skill set will, will will win majority of the time. And I mean, he's only lost, I think, he said when his last God knows how many fights. T.G. Dillashaw, UFC 200. <laughs> And that was after two. That was after he was out for what one or two years. He was out so he for was, a couple of years with that. And then he comes back to fight TJ. What a horrible fight to come back to after yeah. two years out. Yeah. And he didn't and look he's he beat, too bad. Yeah, and he's beaten tough guys. I mean, he's beat Marlon, who was a previous champion. Since that fight, he's looked like an absolute destroyer with his uh, with his finishes. Uh, Jimmy Rivera is a great finish to having a record. Aljo as well. Um, but he's beat Brian Carraway, who's an awkward guy to look good against. Munoz is a tough guy. Uh, he's obviously beaten TJ via split. Um, Rob Font's never an easy guy either. So he he's beaten really good fighters. He's one of the best guys in the bantamweight division. We'll never, ever get the credit he's, he's due. But I'm really hoping this is the fight here where you have to give that guy what he deserves because he's worked for it for years. and never. I mean, he's only lost in eight years, I think, is to TJ Dillashaw. His only other loss was he, when he got knocked out against Eric Coke a long time ago. That seems... I cannot believe how long ago that was, by the way. And that um, was not... Uh, that wasn't Bantamweight either. Yeah, and I think he's, he's one before that was against Faber, and Faber's uh, always a tough, tough guy. That was when he was coming up, yeah. and they were already up. Yeah. They, were, they were, like, way above him, yeah. in the just age, a, so to speak. Yeah, a workman-like fighter who is just very good in every aspect. And I mean, that fight, I've had, as many people say, Moraes won that fight. And the, the one thing with that fight, uh, to me, is the, the scorecard. There was a 30-27 scorecard. I'm like, I don't know how you could give Asun Sao all three rounds in that. He didn't win uh, a second. He didn't win a second. But I yeah. think he'd, he'd stole the first with hurting Moraes. Yeah. Because damage is a factor. And he definitely rocked him the yeah. third round. That round he hit him with a shot. Before he rocked him big yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. And you could see at the end of that fight, excuse me, uh, Marais could tell the fight was close and you know what you're like against that son. So, so this fight here, he has to come out and he has to know that he has to land something effective that is going to win him rounds because if these rounds are, are close, I don't think, I think there was only like one or two strikes between them the entire fight. There was no takedowns. Marais initiated the takedowns. Uh, and like I say, Asun Sao was showing some some ninja shit with, with, with what he was pulling out and them ones there. Um, so he has to come out here and definitively do something to Asun Sao to take those rounds away. And that's hard to do against a guy like Asun Sao because he knows that these guys have to land power strikes, they have to hurt him to take those rounds. So he fights with it, with his capabilities and he will land strikes as well. Like you said, like you said he, he hit him in the first, he hit him in the third. Marais knew that those rounds were close. Um, and ultimately, I, I thought he he won that fight. I picked Asun Sao in the first fight. I was confident when the fight had finished, but I could see where people thought Marais might have won. Um, but I thought, for me, it was pretty clear. Well, it's hard to say pretty clear. I, I definitely thought it was 29-28 either way, but I had it for Asun Sao. Um, over five rounds, it's interesting here because Asun Sao has never been five rounds uh, off the top of my head. Maybe not for a long, long time. Uh, maybe going back in the day. In fact, I don't think he has. Looking at his record now, never, never been, uh, never been after uh, fifteen minutes. But he has fought a lot of fights. Fifteen minutes. So I'm, I'm not questioning his cardio. Marais has the edge over him there because he's had a couple of fights. Went twenty five minutes, which is always nice to have in your back pocket, knowing you've did that before. We're asking so maybe 
I don't think he's that type of fighter that will really rely on that too much. I, I think about that too much. But it's still something that Marais can take a little bit of confidence from. Uh, dangerous. He just That's what I think. If, if Asan Sao doesn't get hit with something devastating, I think he wins these close rounds and he wins the fight. I'm just interested to see the like rounds four and five. If the like the first fifteen minutes is close, like I think it's going to be, the last ten minutes is going to be super interesting to me, and I can see cases for Marlon Moraes winning this fight. I really do, but I'm going to pick Rafael Sunso. I think he's going to do everything right to just win these close rounds. He's a master. Like that's a skill I think to win close rounds and do the right things in the right times in those rounds. That's a skill. If I was a fighter, I'd love to have that. It was a close round. You hit the one strike or you hit the one takedown that wins you the round. It's a huge advantage to have in your back pocket if you can pull that pull that out. Uh, I, I've been kind of going back and forth on this, but I went with Asensio the first fight. I thought he won. Give that extra 10 minutes here. I don't... Marais has to find something that's going to take Asensio out, I think. I think if it goes to cards... I think is going to have just a little bit of an advantage. But Marais has looked great in his last few fights. Cannot take that away from him. I'm going to go Hafe to win this fight via... It might be 48-47. Uh, it might be a split decision. I don't know. Uh, but I like Asun to, to get another win over Mal Marais. And finally, I think get his shot at TJ Dillashaw again and, and get a title shot because it's, it's deserving of one. So, yeah, I'm going to go Hafe Asun via decision. Well, I think you get the trilogy. Yeah. No. Final yeah. answer, and I think it makes perfect sense. It's a good one to sell, um, and obviously, if Henry Cejudo wants to slide and continue, you don't have to defend the belt. So, think, forget yeah. about the bantamweight. Just kind of support that division if you want it to continue yeah. and defend the belt to keep interest in. Yeah. My problem is Henry Cejudo's not going to bring interest to that division. Mm, well, he might. I think. I think he made. Who knows how big how how big he's going to get after that fight card, but. The guy, if I, if I was the UFC, you, you have to kind of get behind the guy because you don't, you don't have too many Olympic gold medalists in, in, in your, your company. And a guy who's not only won and beat Demetrius Johnson, which I still don't think he did, uh, but you don't, don't have two guys who's beat the, the champion, the best champion at 125 and probably the best champion at 135. And the guy, like, they keep going on about speaking different languages, which is always which is always a big thing, I suppose. Um, and not only did he beat TJ, he absolutely annihilated him inside 40 seconds I don't care about the stoppage that was a good stoppage in my opinion um, could have let it go on longer but it is what it is I, um, you think it's a bad stoppage? I do yeah I do I mean, I, 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 my, my reason uh, my reason for it being a bad stoppage is in in a fight because obviously only because I've been in fights before yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I've been in that kind of situation where I've been getting striked upon referee tells you improve your position there was no point at which he wasn't improving his position. And he obviously was constantly trying to get the grapple and exchange going, just trying to close the gap, get his hands around him and hold him and do something. So at no point was he ever stopping. Mm. I, I know he got put back down again, but let's be fair, you've just been rocked. Your balance is going to be off anyway. So even if he didn't clip him with anything big, he could have just clip him with something that would normally not just brush off. He's going to go and maybe fall over. His balance isn't there. Mm. But he wasn't. Did I ever see him really flop? Did I ever really see him go out? Did I ever see him stop moving? Mm. I didn't really I ever see him stop. I think he went limp two or three times. I think when you look at... Now, this is people breaking it down and looking at pictures and stuff. And I've seen a few pictures. Mm. A few times he just looked like he, he went limp, but he was always fighting. He was going for the single leg. He was, yeah. And I can see why. But like I say, Kevin McDonald, the, the, the ref in that fight, didn't really say anything. Um, and you never really heard him say anything, which which was a little bit off putting. I thought it was a good stoppage, but mm. like everybody, you've got more experience in it than I have. Like if you're the fighter in that case, you want the fight to go on, obviously. Yeah. And you want to actually fight through the adversity and stuff. So yeah. that as well, but also it's a championship fight. I think for a championship fight, I, that reminded me similar to Uriah Faber and mm. Hannibal Rao, where I was like, I know Faber wasn't doing much. But he did have hold of a low single. Yeah. And I would have liked that gone a little bit longer to see if he was going to do anything with it. But he wasn't given an opportunity to defect. So, again, with that, I think, yeah, fair enough. If it, and, like, because they're like, oh, he's throwing those strikes. But Suhuda was just throwing his quick little punches in bunches. 
but they weren't power punches. They just to make the referee go, oh my gosh, he's thrown like loads. Yeah. And if you look at it, he didn't actually land as many as it looked because Henry, because TJ was constantly moving, trying to grapple with him. So yeah. not a lot of them were landing clean again. So that's just another factor as well. The referee should communicate, show me something, improve your position. And that is what they say, show me something, improve your position. You just, and he just constantly, and he did exactly what the referees tell you in the ref, in the, in your, in your rules meeting before the fights, all the fights together, the referees are there, this is the rules. And they get told, they know anyway, because they've done it. But they, that's the rule settings, and they know they have to do that. The referee's point of view should have been, show me something, show me something, keep moving, improve position. And I just, in my opinion, I thought, unless TJ's out, not, oh, I think he flopped, I want him out, or he's on the ground and getting hit repetitively. I, I, other than that, I, don't, don't stop the fight. Don't dare stop that fight. No chance. Um, but that's just my opinion. That's yeah. how I saw it. And obviously, you know, everyone's going to have a different opinion. Uh, but yeah, I think, uh, I think I'd like to see the trilogy. But Asun Sao, but the thing with Morais is, like you said, if I'm Asun Sao, what, 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 what he did really well was in that Morais fight, he made him miss a lot. He made him miss a lot of shots. And that's what I think Asun Sao can do. He's really smart. And I think people kind of thought Asun uh, Morais won. But a lot of them didn't land the shots that people maybe thought he did. The amount of times he missed those head kicks yeah. with uber smooth matrix style confidence by just doing this. Like like it was nothing. It was like watching the kick on. Was that it? Like it was disgusting. In the third round as well, he just did it as well. Third round, full fight, went on. <sighs> yeah, cool. I was like, man, that is disgustingly confident. Mm -hmm. But he was smart. He got some glory kickboxes in, I think, for that fight camp. Yeah. And I think I'll do the same again. And it'll have a, a benefit to it. But yeah, um, let's go to bets, Will. What, what do you see on the betting line? So you mentioned before some bets. Just um, again, reaffirm them because obviously some people might not listen to every fight breakdown. They might look for t particular fights they're looking to break down. But if you just go back to the bets you've made and then let's have a look at potential uh, uh, suggestions here. Mm. Uh, two bets. I've got already a uh, Ricardo Ramos plus 110. And the other one was Marcus Perez plus 190. Uh, just two, two fights, especially Ramos. I was not expecting him to be an underdog. But that fight, honestly, the, the betting lines are staying really close, which I thought Ramos might actually go out ahead. I think it's minus 110 apiece now. So uh, people are obviously betting Sead uh, Namagomedov. So that's interesting. Uh, the Marcus Perez one, I just think this is a big step up for Hernandez going to the guy's home country against the guy, a, a far better guy than he's ever faced before, who's durable and hard to look good against. If he doesn't hurt him early, then it comes an interesting fight. Uh, looking at kind of other other fights on the card, I like Charles Oliveira, but the line, it was better to bet Charles Oliveira when he was plus 150, plus 160, plus 170, whatever he was at. Uh, but now he's, he's the favourite. Then I don't think there's, I think you've missed the value in that. So... Talia Santos is one I really like, and the line is coming down. I think she's minus 150, and she was as high as minus 220 in the middle of last week. So people oh. are betting Romero, eh, bet Barella. So that's interesting to me. That's somebody I like a lot. It was someone I was going to put in a parlay, actually, but she's got down so far that she's better to probably bet mm. straight than putting a parlay and, um, and going that. Um, what about, I'm just going to put out there. You did two men together, both subs, Charles Oliveira, Damian Meyer. Could happen. You probably get fairly decent odds, but they, they, they are, that's how they really win fights. So the odds might be watered down a little bit on that. Um, but if you're parlaying together, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably going to get some fairly half decent money off it. Um, but then uh, it might be best for, to go for something like, especially with Damian Meyer, like a uh, double chance with, like, but sub or decision or Charles Oliveira doesn't really finish fights for a TKO so you can maybe put two double chances of sub and decision and you probably get better odds than actually straight subs um, but I'm probably I'm going to have another bet in this fight Santos is probably the leader on that um, Talia Santos and I might put a parley on there's somebody I like from this card here uh, somebody that I think I like from this card here and someone I like for next week's card in Australia that I might put together which uh, I'll, I'll just come out and say it's Kyung Ho Kang 
against Ishihara. I think he's minus 300 over here. I think he's a good parlay piece to put together. I'm not going to mention who the other person is in this card yet because I'm not fully committed to it. But yeah, that's it's a tough card. I think there's a lot of underdogs that could be Thiago Alves. I think it's not a bad underdog to maybe target this week if you, you want to find places. But uh, Asun Sao's still an underdog. But his lines came down from plus 200 to plus 160. So you've lost a little bit of value, but so it's, still value. Good. it's still value. Yeah. So, um, uh, what, about, like, what, what about then uh, maybe Johnny Walker with the finish stoppage? That could and be then, good. And then, yeah, like maybe mixing him up with maybe... Uh, seen, a lot of people are confident in Justin Ledet this week, which surprised okay. me a little bit. Yeah. So that line's actually coming down. So people are baiting him over Johnny Walker at the minute, um, which is interesting. But maybe so, Santos then... Maybe like suggestion probably be like Santos and then uh, like Johnny Walker knockout stuff like that would maybe, maybe. just do that's why else. that's why I did the last card and I might look into that a bit more this year is picking a fighter straight and picking a guy via uh, like like the double chance like I said double before chance, so I, yeah. last card uh, I picked Joseph Benavidez straight out minus two twenty five and I picked Gregor Gillespie by knockout or submission at minus one sixty three. And that parlayed to plus 133, I think it was, which was oh, nice. pretty good. And it's like, uh, Gregor Gillespie is one of those guys that, it, I know the crowd were kind of boom because he was wrestling a lot, but he, he finds a way. It works. And Why? He, he, he demoralizes Why? people. I don't get it. That, He's so, so goddamn animal. good. It's just, whew, it's it just is. the guys, it's late night in New York and they're boozing and they're watching the fights and they've had finishes throughout the card and stuff. But yeah, that's, I quite like, Baiting straight out fighters and then betting them maybe by double chance by knockout or sub, what, those type of guys. So that's something yeah. I'm going to look at this shit a lot as well. So yeah. So there, there you go, folks. There's some suggestions, um, some ideas. It's always good looking at the odds. Um, do it again if you put any odds. Uh, sorry, any odds. If you put any bets on, uh, and you know, throw down below what you've thrown on, and uh, maybe throw out some ideas. If you've put like some parlays together, you know. What did you get? What odds did you get? Also, if you do use a particular site, put it on. For example, I use Paddy Power. Mm -hmm. um, only because I physically can't be asked to register at different sites. I know there's the different sites with different odds. It's I, uh, it, like I've it's got on my phone, I've got a, like a... You know how you can put all your stuff into one place? I've got... Yes. Like, I've got God knows how many bookies that you go into. And it, it is actually a pain in the ass to kind of yeah. go between one another. But... Uh, I was going to do sky bet. I was yeah. going to do sky bet, and as soon as I did that, they asked for my passport and all sorts. I went, I can't be honest yeah. with that, folks. Yeah. Come on! But it's like with me, who who does this fairly serious and wants to do well with it. Um, you're going. So if you go to Paddy Power and it's plus one hundred, you could go to somewhere else and it's plus one twenty. So you're losing yeah. out on value. But um, for someone like you who just does some things for fun to keep, kind of keep your entertainment up a little bit, yeah, that's that's what I do it for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, but. It is a pain in the arse having to go between yeah. different books and, and bookies yeah. and stuff like that as well. So, yeah. So, yeah, if you do get anything, folks, just say where you get it from would be a thing. Feel free to put down a comment on if you think any suggestions would be a good idea. I like Will said they do a crossover with some cards. So, it's good to do that. It's a good, if you can get, if you can find the odds, you can do the bet, put it, you know, do straight bets like that with two potential fighters. It's, it's a good one to do. So, yeah. Put your comments down below. Join in the conversation. We're always there to talk on uh, YouTube. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week because we've not got a break yet for a while now. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your time. And it was a pleasure having you all.